Chapter One of Koto. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Carpenter. Koto being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter One. The Legend of Yure Daki. To Sir Edwin Arnold, in grateful remembrance of kind words. Old Stories The following nine tales have been selected from the Shincho Monshu, Hyaku Monogatari, Ujijui Monogatari Shu, and other old Japanese books to illustrate some strange beliefs. They are only curios. The Legend of Yure Daki near the village of Kurosaka, in the province of Hoki. There is a waterfall called Yure-daki, or the Cascade of Ghosts. Why it is so called, I do not know. Near the foot of the fall there is also a small Shinto shrine of the god of the locality, whom the people name Taki Daimyojin, and in front of the shrine is a little wooden money-box, Saisen Bako, to receive the offerings of believers and there is a story about that money-box. One icy winter's evening, thirty-five years ago, the women and girls employed at a certain Asatoriba, or hemp factory, in Kurosaka, gathered around the big brazier in the spinning-room after their day's work had been done. Then they amused themselves by telling ghost stories. By the time that a dozen stories had been told, most of the gathering felt uncomfortable, and a girl cried out, just to heighten the pleasure of fear. Only think of going this night, all by oneself, to the Yure Daki. The suggestion provoked a general scream, followed by nervous bursts of laughter. I'll give all the hemp I spun today, mockingly said one of the party, to the person who goes. So will I, exclaimed another. And I, said a third. All of us, affirmed a fourth. Then from among the spinners stood up one Yasumoto Okatsu, the wife of a carpenter. She had her only son, a boy of two years old, snugly wrapped up and asleep upon her back. Listen, said Okatsu, if you will all really agree to make over to me all the hemp spun today, I will go to the Yure Daki. Her proposal was received with cries of astonishment and of defiance, but after having been several times repeated, it was seriously taken. Each of the spinners in turn agreed to give up her share of the day's work to Okatsu providing that Okatsu should go to the Yure Daki. "'But how are we to know if she really goes there?' a sharp voice asked. "'Why, let her bring back the money-box of the god,' answered an old woman whom the spinners called Obasan, the grandmother. "'That will be proof enough.' "'I'll bring it,' cried Okatsu, and out she darted into the street, with her sleeping boy upon her back. The night was frosty but clear. Down the empty street Okatsu hurried, and she saw that all the house-fronts were tightly closed, because of the piercing cold. Out of the village and along the high road she ran, picha picha, with the great silence of frozen rice-fields on either hand, and only the stars to light her. Half an hour she followed the open road, then she turned down a narrower way, winding under cliffs. Darker and rougher the path became as she proceeded, but she knew it well and she soon heard the dull roar of the water. A few minutes more, and the way widened into a glen, and the dull roar suddenly became a loud clamor, and before her she saw looming against a mass of blackness the long glimmering of the fall. Dimly she perceived the shrine, the money-box. She rushed forward, put out her hand. "'Oi, Okatsu-san!' suddenly called a warning voice above the crash of the water. Footnote. The exclamation, "Oi!" is used to call the attention of a person. It is the Japanese equivalent for such English exclamations as Hello! Ho there! etc. End footnote. Okatsu stood motionless, stupefied by terror. Oi! Okatsu-san! Again pealed the voice, this time with more of menace in its tone. But Okatsu was a really bold woman. At once recovering from her stupefaction, she snatched up the money-box and ran. She neither heard nor saw anything more to alarm her until she reached the high road, where she stopped a moment to take breath. Then she ran on steadily, picha picha, till she got to Kurosaka, and thumped at the door of the Asatoriba. How the women and the girls cried out as she entered, 
panting with the money-box of the god in her hand. Breathlessly they heard her story, sympathetically they screeched when she told them of the voice that had called her name twice out of the haunted water. What a woman! Brave Okatsu! Well had she earned the hemp. But your boy must be cold, Okatsu, cried the Obasan. Let us have him here by the fire. He ought to be hungry, exclaimed the mother. I must give him his milk presently. Poor Okatsu, said the Obasan, helping to remove the wraps in which the boy had been carried. Why, you are all wet behind. Then with a husky scream the helper vociferated, Ara, it is blood! And out of the wrappings, unfastened, there fell to the floor a blood-soaked bundle of baby clothes that left exposed two very small brown feet and two very small brown hands, nothing more. The child's head had been torn off. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Kotto. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Kurt-Boulet. Kotto, being Japanese curios, with sundry cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter 2 In a Cup of Tea. Have you ever attempted to mount some old tower stairway, spiring up through darkness? and in the heart of that darkness found yourself at the cobwebbed edge of nothing? Or have you followed some coast path, cut along the face of a cliff, only to discover yourself, at a turn, on the jagged verge of a break? The emotional worth of such experience, from a literary point of view, is proved by the force of the sensations aroused and by the vividness with which they are remembered. Now they have been curiously preserved, in old Japanese story-books, certain fragments of fiction that produce an almost similar emotional experience. Perhaps the writer was lazy. Perhaps he had a quarrel with the publisher. Perhaps he was suddenly called away from his little table and never came back. Perhaps death stopped the writing brush in the very middle of a sentence. But no mortal man can ever tell us exactly why these things were left unfinished. I select a typical example. On the fourth day of the first month of the third tenwa, that is to say about two hundred and twenty years ago, the lord Nakagawa Sado, while on his way to make a New Year's visit, halted with his train at a tea-house in Hakusan, in the Hongo district of Yedo. While the party were resting there, one of the lord's attendants, a wakato, note, the armed attendant of a samurai was thus called, the relation of the wakato to the samurai was that of squire to knight end of note named sekinai feeling very thirsty filled for himself a large water cup with tea he was raising the cup to his lips when he suddenly perceived in the transparent yellow infusion the image or reflection of a face that was not his own startled he looked around but could see no one near him the face in the tea appeared from the coiffure to be the face of a young samurai. It was strangely distinct and very handsome, delicate as the face of a girl, and it seemed the reflection of a living face, for the eyes and the lips were moving. Bewildered by this mysterious apparition, Sekinai threw away the tea and carefully examined the cup. It proved to be a very cheap water cup, with no artistic devices of any sort. He found and filled another cup, and again the face appeared in the tea. He then ordered fresh tea, and refilled the cup, and once more the strange face appeared, this time with a mocking smile. But Sekinai did not allow himself to be frightened. "'Whoever you are,' he muttered, "'you shall delude me no further.' Then he swallowed the tea, face and all, and went his way, wondering whether he had swallowed a ghost. Late in the evening of the same day, while on watch in the palace of the Lord Nakagawa, Sekinai was surprised by the soundless coming of a stranger into the apartment. This stranger, a richly dressed young samurai, seated himself directly in front of Sekinai, and, saluting the wakato with a slight bow, observed, I am Shikibu Heinai, met you today for the first time. You do not seem to recognize me. He spoke in a very low but penetrating voice, 
and Sekinai was astonished to find before him the same sinister, handsome face of which he had seen, and swallowed, the apparition in a cup of tea. It was smiling now, as the phantom had smiled, but the steady gaze of the eyes, above the smiling lips, was at once a challenge and an insult. "'No, I do not recognize you,' returned Sekinai, angry but cool, "'and perhaps you will now be good enough to inform me how you obtained admission to this house?' In feudal times the residence of a lord was strictly guarded at all hours, and no one could enter unannounced, except through some unpardonable negligence on the part of the armed watch. "'Ah, you do not recognize me!' exclaimed the visitor, in a tone of irony, drawing a little nearer as he spoke. "'No, you do not recognize me. Yet you took upon yourself this morning to do me a deadly injury.' Sekinai instantly seized the tanto, Note, the shorter of the two swords carried by samurai. The longer sword was called katana. End of note. At his girdle, and made a fierce thrust at the throat of the man. But the blade seemed to touch no substance. Simultaneously and soundlessly the intruder leaped sideward to the chamber wall and through it. The wall showed no trace of his exit. He had traversed it only as the light of a candle passes through lantern paper. When Sekinai made report of the incident, his recital astonished and puzzled the retainers. No stranger had been seen either to enter or to leave the palace at the hour of the occurrence, and no one in the service of the Lord Nakagawa had ever heard of the name Shikibuheinai. On the following night Sekinai was off duty and remained at home with his parents. At a rather late hour he was informed that some strangers had called at the house and desired to speak with him for a moment. Taking his sword, he went to the entrance, and there found three armed men, apparently retainers, waiting in front of the doorstep. The three bowed respectfully to Sekinai, and one of them said, Our names are Matsuo Kabongo, Tsushibashi Bongo, and Okamura Heiroku. We are retainers of the noble Shikibu Heinai, when our master last night deigned to pay you a visit, you struck him with a sword. He was much hurt and has been obliged to go to the hot springs, where his wound is now being treated. But on the sixteenth day of the coming month he will return, and he will then fitly repay you for the injury done him. Without waiting to hear more, Sekinai leaped out, sword in hand, and slashed right and left at the strangers. But the three men sprang to the wall of the adjoining building, and flitted up the wall like shadows, and... Here the old narrative breaks off. The rest of the story existed only in some brain that has been dust for a century. I am able to imagine several possible endings, but none of them would satisfy an occidental imagination. I prefer to let the reader attempt to decide for himself the probable consequence of swallowing a soul. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Koto」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Carpenter « Koto » being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter Three – Common Sense Once there lived upon the mountain called Atagoyama, near Kyoto, a certain learned priest who devoted all his time to meditation and the study of the sacred books. The little temple in which he dwelt was far from any village, and he could not in such a solitude have obtained without help the common necessaries of life. But several devout country people regularly contributed to his maintenance, bringing him each month supplies of vegetables and of rice. Among these good folk there was a certain hunter, who sometimes visited the mountain in search of game. One day, when this hunter had brought a bag of rice to the temple, the priest said to him, Friend, I must tell you that wonderful things have happened here since the last time I saw you. I do not certainly know why such things should have happened in my unworthy presence, but you are aware that I have been meditating and reciting the sutras daily for many years, and it is possible that what has been vouchsafed me is due to the merit obtained through these religious exercises. I am not sure of this, 
but I am sure that Fugen Bosatsu comes nightly to this temple, riding upon his elephant. Stay here with me this night, friend. Then you will be able to see and to worship the Buddha. Footnote. Samantabhadra Bodhisattva. End footnote. To witness so holy a vision, the hunter replied, were a privilege indeed. Most gladly I shall stay and worship with you. So the hunter remained at the temple. But while the priest was engaged in his religious exercises, the hunter began to think about the promised miracle, and to doubt whether such a thing could be. And the more he thought, the more he doubted. There was a little boy in the temple, an acolyte, and the hunter found an opportunity to question the boy. The priest told me, said the hunter, that Fugen Bosatsu comes to this temple every night. Have you also seen Fugen Bosatsu? Six times already, the acolyte replied. I have seen and reverently worshipped Fugen Bosatsu. This declaration only served to increase the hunter's suspicions, though he did not in the least doubt the truthfulness of the boy. He reflected, however, that he would probably be able to see whatever the boy had seen, and he waited with eagerness for the hour of the promised vision. Shortly before midnight the priest announced that it was time to prepare for the coming of Fugen Bosatsu. The doors of the little temple were thrown open, and the priest knelt down at the threshold with his face to the east. The acolyte knelt at his left hand, and the hunter respectfully placed himself behind the priest. It was the night of the twentieth of the ninth month, a dreary, dark, and very windy night, and the three waited a long time for the coming of Fugen Bosatsu. But at last a point of white light appeared, like a star, in the direction of the east, and this light approached quickly, growing larger and larger as it came, and illuminating all the slope of the mountain. Presently the light took shape, the shape of a being divine, riding upon a snow-white elephant with six tusks. And in another moment the elephant with its shining rider arrived before the temple, and there stood, towering, like a mountain of moonlight, wonderful and weird. Then the priest and the boy, prostrating themselves, began with exceeding fervor to repeat the holy invocation to Fugen Bosatsu. But suddenly the hunter rose up behind them, bow in hand, and bending his bow to the full, he sent a long arrow whizzing straight at the luminous Buddha, into whose breast it sank up to the very feathers. Immediately, with a sound like a thunderclap, the white light vanished, and the vision disappeared. Before the temple there was nothing but windy darkness. "'Oh, miserable man!' cried out the priest, with tears of shame and despair. "'Oh, most wretched and wicked man! What have you done? What have you done?' But the hunter received the reproaches of the priest without any sign of compunction or of anger. Then he said very gently, Reverend sir, please try to calm yourself and listen to me. You thought that you were able to see Fugen Bosatsu because of some merit obtained through your constant meditations and your recitation of the sutras. But if that had been the case, the Buddha would have appeared to you only, not to me, nor even to the boy. I am an ignorant hunter, and my occupation is to kill, and the taking of life is hateful to the Buddhas. How, then, should I be able to see Fugen Bosatsu? I have been taught that the Buddhas are everywhere about us, and that we remain unable to see them because of our ignorance and our imperfections. You, being a learned priest of pure life, might indeed acquire such enlightenment as would enable you to see the Buddhas. But how should a man who kills animals for his livelihood find the power to see the divine? Both I and this little boy could see all that you saw. And let me now assure you, reverend sir, that what you saw was not Fugen Bosatsu, but a goblinry intended to deceive you, perhaps even to destroy you. I beg that you will try to control your feelings until daybreak. Then I will prove to you the truth of what I have said. At sunrise the hunter and the priest examined the spot where the vision had been standing, and they discovered a thin trail of blood. And after having followed this trail to a hollow some hundred paces away, they came upon the body of a great badger, transfixed by the hunter's arrow. The priest, although a learned and pious person, had easily been deceived by a badger, but the hunter, an ignorant and irreligious man, was gifted with strong common sense, and by mother wit alone he was able at once to detect and to destroy a dangerous illusion. End of chapter 3
Chapter Four of Koto. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Koto, being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter Four, Ikirio. Footnote, literally living spirit, that is to say, the ghost of a person still alive. An ikirio may detach itself from the body under the influence of anger and proceed to haunt and torment the individual by whom the anger was caused. End of footnote. Formerly, in the quarter of Rei Ganjima in Yedo, there was a great porcelain shop called the Seto Monodana, kept by a rich man named Kihei. Kihei had in his employ for many years a head clerk named Rokubei. Under Rokubei's care the business prospered, and at last it grew so large that Rokubei found himself unable to manage it without help. He therefore asked and obtained permission to hire an experienced assistant, and he then engaged one of his own nephews, a young man about twenty-two years old, who had learned the porcelain trade in Osaka. The nephew proved a very capable assistant, shrewder in business than his experienced uncle. His enterprise extended the trade of the house, and Kihei was greatly pleased. But about seven months after his engagement, the young man became very ill, and seemed likely to die. The best physicians in Yedo were summoned to attend him, but none of them could understand the nature of his sickness. They prescribed no medicine, and expressed the opinion that such a sickness could only have been caused by some secret grief. Rokubei imagined that it might be a case of love-sickness. He therefore said to his nephew, I have been thinking that, as you are still very young, you might have formed some secret attachment which is making you unhappy, perhaps even making you ill. If this be the truth, you certainly ought to tell me all about your troubles. Here I stand to you in the place of a father, as you are far away from your parents, and if you have any anxiety or sorrow, I am ready to do for you whatever a father should do. If money can help you, do not be ashamed to tell me, even though the amount be large. I think that I could assist you, and I am sure that Kihei would be glad to do anything to make you happy and well. The sick youth appeared to be embarrassed by these kindly assurances, and for some little time he remained silent. At last he answered, Never in this world can I forget those generous words, but I have no secret attachment, no longing for any woman. This sickness of mine is not a sickness that doctors can cure, and money could not help me in the least. The truth is that I have been so persecuted in this house that I scarcely care to live. Everywhere, by day and by night, whether in the shop or in my room, whether alone or in company, I have been unceasingly followed and tormented by the shadow of a woman. And it is long, long since I have been able to get even one night's rest. For so soon as I close my eyes, the shadow of the woman takes me by the throat and strives to strangle me. So I cannot sleep. And why did you not tell me this before? asked Rokubei. Because I thought, the nephew answered, that it would be of no use to tell you. The shadow is not the ghost of a dead person. It is made by the hatred of a living person, a person whom you very well know. What person? questioned Rokubei, in great astonishment. 
footnote an ikirio is seen only by the person haunted for another illustration of this curious belief see the paper entitled the stone buddha in my out of the east page one seven one end of footnote the mistress of this house whispered the youth the wife of kihei sama she wishes to kill me Roku bay was bewildered by this confession he doubted nothing of what his nephew had said but he could not imagine a reason for the haunting an ikirio might be caused by disappointed love or by violent hate without the knowledge of the person from whom it had emanated to suppose any love in this case was impossible the wife of kihei was considerably more than fifty years of age but on the other hand what could the young clerk have done to provoke hatred a hatred capable of producing an ikirio he had been irreproachably well conducted unfailingly courteous and earnestly devoted to his duties the mystery troubled roku bey but after careful reflection he decided to tell everything to kihei and to request an investigation kihei was astounded but in the time of forty years he had never had the least reason to doubt the word of roku bey he therefore summoned his wife at once and carefully questioned her telling her at the same time what the sick clerk had said at first she turned pale and wept but after some hesitation she answered frankly i suppose that what the new clerk has said about the ikirio is true though i really tried never to betray by word or look the dislike which i could not help feeling for him you know that he is very skilful in commerce very shrewd in everything that he does and you have given him much authority in this house power over the apprentices and the servants but our only son who should inherit this business is very simple-hearted and easily deceived and i have long been thinking that your clever new clerk might so delude our boy as to get possession of all this property indeed i am certain that your clerk could at any time without the least difficulty and without the least risk to himself ruin our business and ruin our son and with this certainty in my mind i cannot help fearing and hating the man i have often and often wished that he were dead i have even wished that it were in my own power to kill him yes i know that it is wrong to hate any one in such a way but i could not check the feeling night and day i have been wishing evil to that clerk so i cannot doubt that he has really seen the thing of which he spoke to roku bey how absurd of you exclaimed kihei to torment yourself thus up to the present time that clerk has done no single thing for which he could be blamed and you have caused him to suffer cruelly now if i should send him away with his uncle to another town to establish a branch business could you not endeavour to think more kindly of him if i do not see his face or hear his voice the wife answered if you will only send him away from this house then i think that i shall be able to conquer my hatred of him try to do so said kihei for if you continue to hate him as you have been hating him he will certainly die and you will then be guilty of having caused the death of a man who has done us nothing but good he has been in every way a most excellent servant then kihei quickly made arrangements for the establishment of a branch house in another city and he sent roku bey there with the clerk to take charge and thereafter the ikirio ceased to torment the young man who soon recovered his health end of chapter four
Chapter Five of Koto. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna, June 2010. Koto, being Japanese curious, with sundry cobwebs, by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter Five, Shirio. Footnote. The term shirio, dead ghost, that is to say the ghost of a dead person, is used in contradistinction to the term ikirio, signifying the apparition of a living person. Yuhei is a more generic name for ghosts of any sort. End of footnote. On the death of Nomoto Yajiemo, a daikan in the province of Echizen, Footnote. A daikan was a district governor under the direct control of the shogunate. His functions were both civil and judicial. End of footnote. His clerks entered into a conspiracy to defraud the family of their late master. Under pretext of paying some of the daikan's debts, they took possession of all the money, valuables, and furniture in his house and they furthermore prepared a false report to make it appear that he had unlawfully contracted obligations exceeding the worth of his state. This false report they sent to the Saicho, and the Saicho thereupon issued a decree banishing the widow and the children of Nomoto from the province of Echizen. Footnote. The Saicho was a high official of the shogunate, with duties corresponding to those of a prime minister. End of footnote. For in those times the family of Adaikan were held in part responsible, even after his death, for any malfeasance proved against him. But at the moment when the order of banishment was officially announced to the widow of Nomoto, a strange thing happened to a maid servant in the house. She was seized with convulsions and shudderings, like a person possessed, and when the convulsions passed, she rose up and cried out to the officers of the Saicho and to the clerks of her late master. Now listen to me. It is not a girl who is speaking to you. It is I, Yajiemon, Nomoto Yajiemon, return to you from the dead. In grief and great anger do I return. Grief and anger caused by those in whom I vainly put my trust. O oh, you infamous and ungrateful clerks, how could you so forget the favors bestowed upon you as thus to ruin my property and to disgrace my name? Here, now in my presence, let the accounts of my office and of my house be made and let a servant be sent for the books of the Mitsuke, so that the estimates may be compared. Footnote. The Mitsuke was a government official charged with the duty of keeping watch over the conduct of local governors or district judges and of inspecting their accounts. End of footnote. As the maid uttered these words, all present were filled with astonishment, for her voice and her manner were the voice and the manner of Nomoto Yajiemo. The guilty clerks turned pale, but the representatives of the Saicho at once commanded that the desire expressed by the girl should be fully granted. All the account books of the office were promptly placed before her, and the books of the Mitsuke were brought in and she began the reckoning. Without making a single error, she went through all the accounts, writing down the totals and correcting every false entry. And her writing, as she wrote, was seen to be the very writing of Nomoto Yajiemo. Now this re-examination of the accounts not only proved that there had been no indebtedness, but also showed that there had been a surplus in the office treasury at the time of the daikan's death. Thus the villainy of the clerks became manifest. And when all the accounts had been made up, 
the girl said, speaking in the very voice of Nomoto Yajiemon. Now everything is finished, and I can do nothing further in this matter, so I shall go back to the place from which I came. Then she lay down and instantly fell asleep and she slept like a dead person during two days and two nights, for great weariness and deep sleep fall upon the possessed when the possessing spirit passes from them. When she again awoke, her voice and her manner were the voice and the manner of a young girl, and neither at that time, nor at the time after, could she remember what had happened while she was possessed by the ghost of Nomoto Yajiemon. A report of this event was promptly sent to the Saicho, and the Saicho, in consequence, not only revoked the order of banishment, but made large gifts to the family of the Daikan. Later on, various posthumous honors were conferred upon Nomoto Yajiemon, and for many subsequent years his house was favored by the government, so that it prospered greatly but the clerks received the punishment which they deserved. End of chapter 5, Shirio Recording by Anna Chapter 6 of Koto This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Summer Days Koto, Being Japanese Curios with Sundry Cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn Chapter 6 The Story of Okame Okame, daughter of the rich Ganyamon of Nagoshi in the province of Tosa, was very fond of her husband Hachiyamon. She was twenty-two and Hachiyamon twenty-five. She was so fond of him that people imagined her to be jealous, but he never gave her the least cause for jealousy, and it is certain that no single unkind word was ever spoken between them. Unfortunately, the health of Okame was feeble. Within less than two years after her marriage, she was attacked by a disease then prevalent in Tosa, and the best doctors were not able to cure her. Persons seized by this malady could not eat or drink. They remained constantly drowsy and languid and troubled by strange fancies. And in spite of constant care, Okame grew weaker and weaker, day by day, until it became evident even to herself that she was going to die. Then she called her husband and said to him, I cannot tell you how good you have been to me during this miserable sickness of mine. Surely no one could have been more kind but that only makes it all the harder for me to leave you now. Think, I am not yet even twenty-five, and I have the best husband in all this world, and yet I must die. Oh, no, no, it is useless to talk to me about hope. The best Chinese doctors could do nothing for me. I did think to live a few months longer, but when I saw my face this morning in the mirror, I knew that I must die today, yes, this very day. And there is something that I want to beg you to do for me, if you wish me to die quite happy. Only tell me what it is, Hachiyamon answered, and if it be in my power to do, I shall be more than glad to do it. No, no, you will not be glad to do it, she returned. You are still so young. It is difficult, very, very difficult, even to ask you to do such a thing. Yet the wish for it is like a fire burning in my breast. I must speak it before I die. My dear, you know that sooner or later, after I am dead, they will want you to take another wife. Will you promise me, can you promise me, not to marry again? Only that, Hachiyomon explained. Why, if that be all that you wanted to ask for, your wish is very easily granted. With all my heart I promise you that no one shall ever take your place. Ah! Ureshia! cried Okami, half rising from her couch. Oh, how happy you have made me! And she fell back dead. Now the health of Hachiyamon appeared to fail after the death of Okami. 
at first the change in his aspect was attributed to natural grief and the villagers only said how fond of her he must have been but as the months went by he grew paler and weaker until at last he became so thin and wan that he looked more like a ghost than a man then people began to suspect that sorrow alone could not explain this sudden decline of a man so young the doctors said that hachiamon was not suffering from any known form of disease they could not account for his condition but they suggested that it might have been caused by some very unusual trouble of mind hachiamon's parents questioned him in vain he had no cause for sorrow he said other than what they already knew they counselled him to remarry but he protested that nothing could ever induce him to break his promise to the dead thereafter hachiyamon continued to grow visibly weaker day by day and his family despaired of his life but one day his mother who felt sure that he had been concealing something from her adjured him so earnestly to tell her the real cause of his decline and wept so bitterly before him that he was not able to resist her entreaties mother he said it is very difficult to speak about this matter either to you or to any one and perhaps when i have told you everything you will not be able to believe me but the truth is that okame can find no rest in the other world and that the buddhist services repeated for her have been said in vain perhaps she will never be able to rest unless i go with her on the long black journey for every night she returns and lies down by my side every night since the day of her funeral she has come back and sometimes i doubt if she really be dead for she looks and acts just as when she lived except that she talks to me only in whispers and she always bids me tell no one that she comes it may be that she wants me to die and i should not care to live for my own sake only but it is true as you have said that my body really belongs to my parents and that i owe to them the first duty so now mother i tell you the whole truth yes every night she comes just as i am about to sleep and she remains until dawn as soon as she hears the temple bell she goes away when the mother of hachiyamon had heard these things she was greatly alarmed and hastening at once to the parish temple she told the priest all that her son had confessed and begged for ghostly help the priest who was a man of great age and experience listened without surprise to the recital and then said to her it is not the first time that i have known such a thing to happen and i think that i shall be able to save your son but he is really in great danger i have seen the shadow of death upon his face and if okami return but once again he will never behold another sunrise whatever can be done for him must be done quickly say nothing of the matter to your son but assemble the members of both families as soon as possible and tell them to come to the temple without delay for your son's sake it will be necessary to open the grave of okame so the relatives assembled at the temple and when the priest had obtained their consent to the opening of the sepulchre he led the way to the cemetery then under his direction the tombstone of okame was shifted the grave opened and the coffin raised and when the coffin lid had been removed all present were startled for okame sat before them with a smile upon her face seeming as comely as before the time of her sickness and there was not any sign of death upon her but when the priest told his assistants to lift the dead woman out of the coffin the astonishment changed to fear for the corpse is blood warm to the touch and still flexible as in life notwithstanding the squatting posture in which it had remained for so long footnote the japanese dead are placed in a sitting posture in the coffin which is almost square in form it was borne to the mortuary chapel and there the priest with a writing brush traced upon the brow and breast and limbs of the body the sanskrit characters or bonji of certain holy talismanic words and he formed the segaki service for the spirit of okami before suffering her corpse to be restored to the ground she never again visited her husband and hachiyamon gradually recovered his health and strength but whether he always kept his promise, the Japanese storyteller does not say. End of chapter 6 Recording by Summer Days Chapter 7 of Koto. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Carpenter. Koto being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs. By Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter 7. Story of a Fly. About two hundred years ago there lived in Kyoto a merchant named Kazaria Kyube. His shop was in the street called Teramachidori, a little south of the Shimabara thoroughfare. He had a maid-servant named Tama, a native of the province of Wakasa. Tama was treated kindly by Kyube and his wife, and appeared to be sincerely attached to them. But she never cared to dress nicely, like other girls, and whenever she had a holiday, she would go out in her working dress, notwithstanding that she had been given several pretty robes. After she had been in the service of Kyube for about five years, he one day asked her why she never took any pains to look neat. Tama blushed at the reproach implied by this question, and answered respectfully, When my parents died, I was a very little girl, and as they had no other child, it became my duty to have the Buddhist services performed on their behalf. At that time I could not obtain the means to do so, but I resolved to have their ihai, mortuary tablets, placed in the temple called Jorakuji, and to have the rites performed so soon as I could earn the money required. And in order to fulfill this resolve, I have tried to be saving of my money and my clothes. Perhaps I have been too saving, as you have found me negligent of my person, but I have already been able to put by about one hundred mome of silver for the purpose which I have mentioned, and hereafter I will try to appear before you looking neat, so I beg that you will kindly excuse my past negligence and rudeness. Kyube was touched by this simple confession, and he spoke to the girl kindly, assuring her that she might consider herself at liberty thenceforth to dress as she pleased, and commending her filial piety. Soon after this conversation the maid Tama was able to have the tablets of her parents placed in the temple Jorakuji, and to have the appropriate services performed. Of the money which she had saved she thus expended seventy mome, and the remaining thirty mome she asked her mistress to keep for her. But early in the following winter Tama was suddenly taken ill, and after a brief sickness she died, on the eleventh day of the first month of the fifteenth year of Genroku. 1702. Kyube and his wife were much grieved by her death. Now about ten days later, a very large fly came into the house and began to fly round and round the head of Kyube. This surprised Kyube, because no flies of any kind appear, as a rule, during the period of greatest cold, and the larger kinds of flies are seldom seen except in the warm season. The fly annoyed Kyube so persistently that he took the trouble to catch it and put it out of the house, being careful the while to injure it in no way, for he was a devout Buddhist. It soon came back again, and was again caught and thrown out, but it entered a third time. Kyube's wife thought this a strange thing. I wonder, she said, if it is Tama, for the dead, particularly those who pass to the state of Gaki, sometimes return in the form of insects. Kyube laughed and made answer, Perhaps we can find out by marking it. He caught the fly, and slightly nicked the tips of its wings with a pair of scissors, after which he carried it to a considerable distance from the house, and let it go. Next day it returned. Kyube still doubted whether its return had any ghostly significance. He caught it again, painted its wings and body with Benny, rouge, carried it away from the house to a much greater distance than before, and set it free. But two days later it came back, all red, and Kyube ceased to doubt. I think it is Tama, he said. She wants something, but what does she want? The wife responded, I still have thirty mome of her savings. Perhaps she wants us to pay that money to the temple for a Buddhist service on behalf of her spirit. Tama was always very anxious about her next birth. As she spoke, the fly fell from the paper window on which it had been resting. Kyube picked it up and found that it was dead. Thereupon the husband and wife resolved to go to the temple at once, and to pay the girl's money to the priests. They put the body of the fly into a little box, and took it along with them. Jiku Shonin, the chief priest of the temple, on hearing the story of the fly, decided that Kyube and his wife had acted rightly in the matter. Then Jiku Shonin performed a segaki service on behalf of the spirit of Tama, 
and over the body of the fly were recited the eight rolls of the sutra myoten and the box containing the body of the fly was buried in the grounds of the temple and above the place a sotoba was set up appropriately inscribed end of chapter seven chapter eight of koto this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by summer days koto being japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by lafcadio hearn chapter eight story of a pheasant in the Toyama district of the province of Bishu, there formerly lived a young farmer and his wife. Their farm was situated in a lonely place among the hills. One night the wife dreamed that her father-in-law, who had died some years before, came to her and said, "'Tomorrow I shall be in great danger. Try to save me if you can.' In the morning she told this to her husband, and they talked about the dream." Both imagined that the dead man wanted something, but neither could imagine what the words of the vision signified. After breakfast, the husband went to the fields, but the wife remained at her loom. Presently, she was startled by a great shouting outside. She went to the door and saw the Jito, or the lord of the district, who acted both as governor and magistrate, with a hunting party approaching the farm. While she stood watching them, a pheasant ran by her into the house, and suddenly she remembered her dream. Perhaps it is my father-in-law, she thought to herself. I must try to save it. Then, hurrying in after the bird, a fine male pheasant, she caught it without any difficulty, put it into the empty rice pot, and covered the pot with the lid. A moment later, some of the Jito's followers entered and asked her whether she had seen a pheasant. She answered boldly that she had not, but one of the hunters declared that he had seen the bird run into the house. So the party searched for it, peeping into every nook and corner, but nobody thought of looking into the rice pot. After looking everywhere else to no purpose, the men decided that the bird must have escaped through some hole, and they went away. When the farmer came home, his wife told him about the pheasant, which she had left in the rice pot so that he might see it. When I caught it, she said, it did not struggle in the least, and it remained very quiet in the pot. I really think that it is father-in-law. The farmer went to the pot, lifted the lid, and took out the bird. It remained still in his hands, as if tame, and looked at him as if accustomed to his presence. One of its eyes was blind. Father was blind of one eye, the farmer said, the right eye, and the right eye of this bird is blind. Really, I think it is father. See, it looks at us just as father used to do. Poor father must have thought to himself, now that I am a bird, better to give my body to my children for food than to let the hunters have it. And that explains your dream of last night, he added, turning to his wife with an evil smile as he wrung the pheasant's neck. At the sight of that brutal act, the woman screamed and cried out, "'Oh, you wicked man! Oh, you devil! Only a man with the heart of a devil could do what you have done, and I would rather die than continue to be the wife of such a man!' And she sprang to the door, without waiting even to put on her sandals. He caught her sleeve as she leaped, but she broke away from him and ran out, sobbing as she ran. And she ceased not to run barefooted till she reached the town, when she hastened directly to the residence of the Jito. Then, with many tears, she told the Jito everything, her dream of the night before the hunting, and how she had hidden the pheasant in order to save it, and how her husband had mocked her and had killed it. The Jito spoke to her kindly, and gave orders that she should be well cared for, but he commanded his officers to seize her husband. Next day, the farmer was brought up for judgment, and, after he had been made to confess the truth concerning the killing of the pheasant, sentence was pronounced. The Jito said to him, 
only a person of evil heart could have acted as you have acted and the presence of so perverse a being is a misfortune to the community in which he happens to reside the people under our jurisdiction are people who respect the sentiment of filial piety and among them you cannot be suffered to live so the farmer was banished from the district and forbidden ever to return to it on pain of death but to the woman the jito made a donation of land and at a later time he caused her to be provided with a good husband end of chapter eight recording by summer days chapter nine of kotto this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Kurt-Boulet. Kotto, being Japanese curios, with sundry cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter 9. The Story of Chuguro. A long time ago there lived, in the Koishikawa quarter of Yedo, a Batamoto named Suzuki, whose yashiki was situated on the bank of the Yedogawa, not far from the bridge called Nakanuhashi, and among the retainers of the Suzuki there was an Esbigaru. Note, the Esbigaru were the lowest class of retainers in military service. End of note. Named Chugoro. Chugoro was a handsome lad, very amiable and clever, and much liked by his comrades. For several years Chugoro remained in the service of Suzuki, conducting himself so well that no fault was found with him. But at last the other as Bigaru discovered that Chugoro was in the habit of leaving the Ashiki every night by way of the garden and staying out until a little before dawn. At first they said nothing to him about this strange behavior, for his absences did not interfere with any regular duty and were supposed to be caused by some love affair. But after a time he began to look pale and weak, and his comrades, suspecting some serious folly, decided to interfere. Therefore, one evening, just as he was about to steal away from the house, an elderly retainer called him aside and said, Chugoro, my lad, we know that you go out every night and stay away until early morning, and we have observed that you are looking unwell. We fear that you are keeping bad company and injuring your health, and unless you can give a good reason for your conduct, we shall think that it is our duty to report this matter to the chief officer. In any case, since we are your comrades and friends, it is but right that we should know why you go out at night, contrary to the custom of this house. Chugoro appeared to be very much embarrassed and alarmed by these words, but after a short silence he passed into the garden, followed by his comrade. When the two found themselves well out of hearing of the rest, Chugoro stopped and said, I will now tell you everything, but I must entreat you to keep my secret. If you repeat what I tell you, some great misfortune may befall me. It was in the early part of last spring, about five months ago, that I first began to go out at night on account of a love affair. One evening, when I was returning to the Yashiki, after a visit to my parents, I saw a woman standing by the riverside, not far from the main gateway. She was dressed like a person of high rank, and I thought it strange that a woman so finely dressed should be standing there alone at such an hour. But I did not think that I had any right to question her, and I was about to pass her by, without speaking, when she stepped forward and pulled me by the sleeve. Then I saw that she was very young and handsome. "'Will you not walk with me as far as the bridge?' she said. "'I have something to tell you.' Her voice was very soft and pleasant, and she smiled as she spoke and her smile was hard to resist. So I walked with her toward the bridge, and on the way she told me that she had often seen me going in and out of the yashiki, and had taken a fancy to me. "'I wish to have you for my husband,' she said. "'If you can like me, we shall be able to make each other very happy.' I did not know how to answer her, but I thought her very charming. As we neared the bridge, she pulled my sleeve again, and led me down the bank to the very edge of the river. "'Come in with me,' she whispered, and pulled me toward the water. "'It is deep there, as you know, and I became all at once afraid of her, and tried to turn back. She smiled and caught me by the wrist, and said, "'Oh, you must never be afraid with me.' And, somehow, at the touch of her hand, I became more helpless than a child. 
I felt like a person in a dream who tries to run and cannot move hand or foot. Into the deep water she stepped and drew me with her, and I neither saw nor heard nor felt anything more until I found myself walking beside her through what seemed to be a great palace full of light. I was neither wet nor cold. Everything around me was dry and warm and beautiful. I could not understand where I was, nor how I had come there. The woman led me by the hand. We passed through room after room, through ever so many rooms, all empty but very fine, until we entered into a guest room of a thousand mats. Before a great alcove, at the farther end, lights were burning, and cushions laid as for a feast, but I saw no guests. She led me to the place of honor, by the alcove, and seated herself in front of me, and said, This is my home. Do you think that you could be happy with me here? As she asked the question she smiled, and I thought that her smile was more beautiful than anything else in the world, and out of my heart I answered, Yes. In the same moment I remembered the story of Urashima, and I imagined that she might be the daughter of a god, but I feared to ask her any questions. Presently maid-servants came in, bearing rice-wine and many dishes, which they set before us. Then she who sat before me said, "'Tonight shall be our bridal night, because you like me, and this is our wedding feast.' We pledged ourselves to each other for the time of seven existences and after the banquet we were conducted to a bridal chamber which had been prepared for us. It was yet early in the morning when she awoke me, and said, My dear one, you are now indeed my husband, but for reasons which I cannot tell you, and which you must not ask, it is necessary that our marriage remain secret. To keep you here until daybreak would cost both of us our lives. Therefore do not, I beg of you, feel displeased because i must now send you back to the house of your lord you can come to me to-night again and every night hereafter at the same hour that we first met wait always for me by the bridge and you will not have to wait long but remember above all things that our marriage must be a secret and that if you talk about it we shall probably be separated for ever i promise to obey her in all things remembering the fate of urashima and she conducted me through many rooms, all empty and beautiful, to the entrance. There she again took me by the wrist, and everything suddenly became dark, and I knew nothing more until I found myself standing alone on the river bank, close to the Nakanohashi. When I got back to the Yashiki, the temple bells had not yet begun to ring. In the evening I went again to the bridge, at the hour she had named, and I found her waiting for me. She took me with her, as before, into the deep water, and into the wonderful place where we had passed our bridal night. And every night, since then, I have met and parted from her in the same way. To-night she will certainly be waiting for me, and I would rather die than disappoint her. Therefore I must go. But let me again entreat you, my friend, never to speak to any one about what I have told you. The elder Aspigaru was surprised and alarmed by this story. He felt that Chukoro had told him the truth, and the truth suggested unpleasant possibilities. Probably the whole experience was an illusion, and an illusion produced by some evil power for a malevolent end. Nevertheless, if really bewitched, the lad was rather to be pitied than blamed, and any forcible interference would be likely to result in mischief. So the Asbigaru answered kindly, I shall never speak of what you have told me, Never, at least, while you remain alive and well. Go and meet the woman, but beware of her. I fear that you are being deceived by some wicked spirit. Chugoro only smiled at the old man's warning, and hastened away. Several hours later he re-entered the Yashiki with a strangely dejected look. Did you meet her? whispered his comrade. No, replied Chugoro. She was not there. For the first time she was not there. I think that you will never meet me again. I did wrong to tell you. I was very foolish to break my promise. The other vainly tried to console him. Chugoro lay down and spoke no word more. He was trembling from head to foot, as if he had caught a chill. When the temple bells announced the hour of dawn, Chugoro tried to get up and fell back senseless. He was evidently sick, 
deathly sick. A Chinese physician was summoned. Why, the man has no blood, exclaimed the doctor, after a careful examination. There is nothing but water in his veins. It will be very difficult to save him. What maleficence is this? Everything was done that could be done to save Chugoro's life, but in vain. He died as the sun went down. Then his comrade related the whole story. Ha! Huh, I might have suspected as much, exclaimed the doctor. No power could have saved him. He was not the first whom she destroyed. Who is she, or what is she? the Asbigaru asked. A foxwoman? No, she has been hunting this river from ancient time. She loves the blood of the young. A serpent woman? A dragon woman? No, no. If you were to see her under that bridge by daylight, she would appear to you a very loathsome creature. But what kind of a creature? Simply a frog. A great and ugly frog. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of Kotto This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Awaii in June 2010. Kotto, being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by Lefkadio Hearn. Chapter 10 A Woman's Diary, Part 1 recently there was put into my hands a somewhat remarkable manuscript seventeen long narrow sheets of soft paper pierced with a silken string and covered with fine japanese characters it was a kind of diary containing the history of a woman's married life recorded by herself the writer was dead and the diary had been found in a small work-box haribako which had belonged to her the friend who lent me the manuscript gave me leave to translate as much of it as i might think worth publishing i have gladly availed myself of this unique opportunity to present in english the thoughts and feelings joys and sorrows of a simple woman of the people just as she herself recorded them in the frankest possible way never dreaming that any foreign eye would read her humble and touching memoir but out of respect to her gentle ghost i have tried to use the manuscript in such a way only as could not cause her the least pain if she were yet in the body and able to read me some parts i have omitted because i thought them sacred also i have left out a few details relating to customs or to local beliefs that the western reader could scarcely understand even with the aid of notes and the names of course have been changed Otherwise, I have followed the text as closely as I could, making no changes of phrase except when the Japanese original could not be adequately interpreted by literal rendering. In addition to the facts stated or suggested in the diary itself, I could learn but very little of the writer's personal history. She was a woman of the poorest class, and from her own narrative it appears that she remained unmarried until she was nearly thirty. A younger sister had been married several years previously, and the diary does not explain this departure from custom. A small photograph found with the manuscript shows that its author never could have been called good-looking, but the face has a certain pleasing expression of shy gentleness. Her husband was a kozukai, employed in one of the great public offices, chiefly for night duty, at a salary of ten yen per month. Footnote. A kozukai is a man-servant chiefly employed as doorkeeper and messenger. The term is rendered better by the French word concierge than by our English word porter, but neither expression exactly meets the Japanese meaning. End footnote. In order to help him to meet the expenses of housekeeping, she made cigarettes for a tobacco dealer. The manuscript shows that she must have been at school for some years. She could write the kana very nicely, but she had not learned many Chinese characters, so that her work resembles the work of a schoolgirl. But it is written without mistakes and skillfully. The dialect is of Tokyo, the common speech of the city people, full of idiomatic expressions, but entirely free from coarseness. 
some one might naturally ask why this poor woman so much occupied with the constant struggle for mere existence should have taken the pains to write down what she probably never intended to be read i would remind such a questioner of the old japanese teaching that literary composition is the best medicine for sorrow and i would remind him also of the fact that even among the poorest classes poems are still composed upon all occasions of joy or pain the latter part of the diary was written in lonely hours of illness and i suppose that she then wrote chiefly in order to keep her thoughts composed at a time when solitude had become dangerous for her a little before her death her mind gave way and these final pages probably represent the last brave struggle of the spirit against the hopeless weakness of the flesh i found that the manuscript was inscribed on the outside sheet with the title mukashi banashi a story of old times according to circumstances the word mukashi may signify either long ago in reference to past centuries or old times in reference to one's own past life the latter is the obvious meaning in the present case mukashi banashi on the evening of the twenty-fifth day of the ninth month of the twenty-eighth year of meiji eighteen ninety five the man of the opposite house came and asked as for the eldest daughter of this family is it agreeable that she be disposed of in marriage then the answer was given even though the matter were agreeable to our wishes no preparation for such an event has yet been made footnote the reader must understand that the man of the opposite house is acting as nakodo or matchmaker in the interest of a widower who wishes to remarry by the statement no preparation has been made the father means that he is unable to provide for his daughter's marriage and cannot furnish her with a bridal outfit clothing household furniture etc as required by custom the reply that no preparation is needed signifies that the proposed husband is willing to take the girl without any marriage gifts End footnote. the man of the opposite house said but as no preparation is needed in this case will you not honourably give her to the person for whom i speak he is said to be a very steady man and he is thirty-eight years of age as i thought your eldest girl to be about twenty-six i proposed her to him no she is twenty-nine years old was answered ah that being the case i must again speak to the other party and i shall honourably consult with you after i have seen him so saying the man went away next evening the man came again this time with the wife of okadashi a friend of the family and said the other party is satisfied so if you are willing the match can be made father replied as the two are both of them shichi seki kin seven red metal they should have the same nature so i think that no harm can come of it footnote the father has evidently been consulting a fortune-telling book such as the san tse so or a professional diviner the allusion to the astrologically determined natures or temperaments of the pair could scarcely be otherwise explained End footnote. the matchmaker asked then how would it be to arrange for the miai tomorrow footnote miai is a term used to signify a meeting arranged in order to enable the parties affianced to see each other before the wedding day End footnote father said i suppose that everything really depends upon the n karma relation formed in previous states of existence well then i beg that you will honourably meet us to-morrow evening at the house of okada thus the betrothal promise was given on both sides the person of the opposite house wanted me to go with him next evening to okada's but i said that i wished to go with my mother only as from the time of taking such a first step one could not either retreat or advance when i went with mother to the house we were welcomed in with the words kotira e 
then my future husband and i greeted each other for the first time but somehow i felt so much ashamed that i could not look at him then okada shi said to namiki shi the proposed husband now that you have nobody to consult with at home would it not be well for you to snatch your luck where you find it as the proverb says tsen wa isoge the answer was made as for me i am well satisfied but i do not know what the feeling may be on the other side if it be honourably deigned to take me as it is honourably known that i am i said footnote meaning i am ready to become your wife if you are willing to take me as you have been informed that i am a poor girl without money or clothes End footnote. the matchmaker said the matter being so what would be a good day for the wedding namiki shi answered though i can be at home to-morrow perhaps the first day of the tenth month would be a better day but okada shi at once said as there is cause for anxiety about the house being unoccupied while namiki shi is absent on night duty to-morrow would perhaps be the better day would it not though at first that seemed to me much too soon i presently remembered that the next day was a taian nichi perfectly fortunate day so i gave my consent and we went home footnote lucky and unlucky days were named and symbolized as follows according to the old japanese astrological system senkatsu forenoon good afternoon bad tomobiki forenoon good afternoon good at the beginning and the end but bad in the middle senpu forenoon bad afternoon good butsu metsu wholly unlucky taian altogether good shako all unlucky except at noon End footnote. when i told father he was not pleased he said that it was too soon and that a delay of at least three or four days ought to have been allowed also he said that the direction was not lucky and that other conditions were not favourable this statement also implies that a professional diviner has been consulted the reference to the direction or hogaku can be fully understood only by those conversant with the old chinese nature philosophy End footnote. i said but i have already promised and i cannot now ask to have the day changed indeed it would be a great pity if a thief were to enter the house in his absence as for the matter of the direction being unlucky even though i should have to die on that account i would not complain for i should die in my own husband's house and to-morrow i added i shall be too busy to call on goto her brother-in-law so i must go there now i went to goto's but when i saw him i felt afraid to say exactly what i had come to say i suggested it only by telling him to-morrow i have to go to a strange house goto immediately asked as an honourable daughter-in-law bride after hesitating i answered at last yes what kind of a person goto asked i answered if i had felt myself able to look at him long enough to form any opinion i would not have put mother to the trouble of going with me Anisan, elder sister he exclaimed then what was the use of going to see him at all but he added in a more pleasant tone let me wish you luck anyhow i said to-morrow it will be and i returned home now the appointed day having come the twenty-eighth day of the ninth month i had so much to do that i did not know how i should ever be able to get ready and as it had been raining for several days the roadway was very bad which made matters worse for me though luckily no rain fell on that day i had to buy some little things and i could not well ask mother to do anything for me much as i wished for her help because her feet had become very weak by reason of her great age so i got up very early and went out alone and did the best i could 
nevertheless it was two o'clock in the afternoon before i got everything ready then i had to go to the hairdressers to have my hair dressed and go to the bathhouse all of which took time and when i came back to dress i found that no message had yet been received from namikishi and i began to feel a little anxious just after we had finished supper the message came i had scarcely time to say good-bye to all then i went out leaving my home behind forever and walked with mother to the house of okadashi there i had to part even from mother and the wife of okadashi taking charge of me i accompanied her to the house of namikishi in funamachi the wedding ceremony of the sansan kudo no sakatsuki literally thrice three nine times wine cup having been performed without any difficulty and the time of the ohiraki honorably blossoming having come more quickly than i had expected the guests all returned home footnote at a japanese wedding it is customary to avoid the use of any words to which an unlucky signification attaches or of any words suggesting misfortune in even an indirect way the word sumu to finish or to end the word kaeru to return suggesting divorce as well as many others are forbidden at weddings accordingly the term ohiraki has long been euphemistically substituted for the term oitoma honorable leave-taking that is farewell in the popular etiquette of wedding assemblies End footnote. so we two were left for the first time each alone with the other sitting face to face my heart beat wildly and i felt abashed in such a way as could not be expressed by means of ink and paper footnote i felt a tumultuous beating within my breast would perhaps be a closer rendering of the real sense but it would sound oddly artificial by comparison with the simple japanese utterance atoni wa futari saspi mukai tonari mune uchi sawagi sono batsu kashisa bispi ni tsukuspi gataspi indeed what i felt can be imagined only by one who remembers leaving her parents home for the first time to become a bride a daughter-in-law in a strange house afterward at the hour of meals i felt very much distressed embarrassed two or three days later the father of my husband's former wife who was dead visited me and said namikishi is really a good man a moral steady man but as he is also very particular about small matters and inclined to find fault you had better always be careful to try to please him now as i had been carefully watching my husband's ways from the beginning i knew that he was really a very strict man and i resolved so to conduct myself in all matters as never to cross his will the fifth day of the tenth month was the day for our satogaeri and for the first time we went out together calling at goto's on the way footnote from sato the parental home and kaeri to return the first visit of a bride to her parents after marriage is thus called End footnote. after we left goto's the weather suddenly became bad and it began to rain then we borrowed a paper umbrella which we used as an aigasa and though i was very uneasy lest any of my former neighbors should see us walking thus together we luckily reached my parents house and we made our visit of duty without any trouble at all footnote aigasa a fantastic term compounded from the verb ai to accord to harmonize and the noun casa an umbrella it signifies one umbrella used by two persons especially lovers an umbrella of loving accord to understand the wife's anxiety about being seen walking with her husband under the borrowed umbrella the reader must know that it is not yet considered decorous for wife and husband even to walk side by side in public a newly wedded pair using a single umbrella in this way would be particularly liable to have jests made at their expense jests that might prove trying to the nerves of a timid bride End footnote. while we were in the house the rain fortunately stopped 
on the ninth day of the same month i went with him to the theatre for the first time we visited the engisa at akasaka and saw a performance by the yamaguchi company on the eighth day of the eleventh month we made a visit to asakusa temple and also went to the shinto temple of the otorisama footnote she means the great buddhist temple of kwanon the most popular and perhaps the most famous buddhist temple in tokyo End footnote. during this last month of the year i made new spring robes for my husband and myself then i learned for the first time how pleasant such work was and i felt very happy on the twenty-fifth day we visited the temple of tenjin sama and walked about the grounds there footnote in the okubo quarter the shrine is shadowed by a fine grove of trees End footnote. on the eleventh day of the first month of the twenty-ninth year eighteen ninety six called the okadas on the twelfth day we paid a visit to gotos and had a pleasant time there on the ninth day of the second month we went to the mitsaki theatre to see the play imose yama on our way to the theatre we met gotoshi unexpectedly and he went with us but unluckily it began to rain as we were returning home and we found the roads very muddy on the twenty-second day of the same month we had our photograph taken at amanos on the twenty-fifth day of the third month we went to the haruki theatre and saw the play uguizutsuka during the month it was agreed that all of us kindred friends and parents should make up a party and enjoy our hanami together but this could not be managed footnote that is to say it was agreed that we should all go together to see the flowers the word hanami flower seeing might be given to any of the numerous flower festivals of the year according to circumstances but it here refers to the season of cherry blossoms throughout this diary the dates are those of the old lunar calendar End footnote. on the tenth day of the fourth month at nine o'clock in the morning we two went out for a walk we first visited the shokonsha shinto shrine at kudan thence we walked to ueno park and from there we went to asakusa and visited the kwanon temple and we also prayed at the monseki higashi hongwanji thence we had intended to go round to asakusa okuyama but we thought that it would be better to have dinner first so we went to an eating-house while we were dining we heard such a noise of shouting and screaming that we thought there was a great quarrel outside but the trouble was really caused by a fire in one of the misemono shows the fire spread quickly even while we were looking at it and nearly all the show buildings in that street were burnt up we left the eating-house soon after and walked about the asakusa grounds looking at things here follows in the original manuscript the text of a little poem composed by the writer herself imado no watashi ni te ai mita koto mo naki hito ni fushigi ni mimeguri inari kaku mo fufu ni naru no mika hajime no omoe ni hikikaete itsushika kokoro mo sumida gaba tsugai hanarenu miyakodori hito mo urayame ba wagami mo mata Sakimida retaru tote no hana yori mo hana ni momashita sono hito to shirahige yashiro ni naru made mo soitoke tashi to inori nenji footnote a literal rendering is almost impossible there is a fairy called the fairy of imado over the sumidagawa but the reference here is really neither to the fairy nor to the ferryman but to the nakodo or matchmaker who arranged the marriage mimeguri inari is the popular name of a famous temple of the god of rice in mukojima but there is an untranslatable play here upon the name suggesting a lover's meeting the reference to the sumidagawa also contains a play upon the syllables sumi the verb sumi signifies to be clear shirabige yashiro white-haired temple is the name of a real and very celebrated shinto shrine in the city 
but the name is here used chiefly to express the hope that the union may last into the period of hoary age besides these suggestions we may suppose that the poem contains allusions to the actual journey made over the sumidagawa by ferry and thence to the various temples named from old times poems of like meaning have been made about these places but the lines above given are certainly original with the obvious exception of a few phrases which have become current coin in popular poetry End footnote. freely translated having been taken across the imado ferry i strangely met at the temple of mimeguri inari with a person whom i had never seen before because of this meeting our relation is now even more than the relation of husband and wife and my first anxious doubt for how long having passed away my mind has become clear as the sumida river indeed we are now like a pair of miyako birds always together and i even think that i deserve to be envied to see the flowers we went out but more than the pleasure of viewing a whole shore in blossom is the pleasure that i now desire always to dwell with this person dearer to me than any flower until we enter the shirahige yashiro that we may so remain together i supplicate the gods then we crossed the azuma bridge on our homeward way and we went by steamer to the kaicho of the temple of the soga kyodai and prayed that love and concord should continue always between ourselves and our brothers and sisters it was after seven o'clock that evening when we got home footnote the soga brothers were famous heroes of the twelfth century the word kaicho signifies the religious festival during which the principal image of a temple is exposed to view End footnote. on the twenty-fifth day of the same month we went to the rokomono no yose footnote name of a public hall at which various kinds of entertainments are given more especially recitations by professional storytellers End footnote on the second day of the fifth month we visited the gardens at okubo to see the azaleas in blossom on the sixth day of the same month we went to see a display of fireworks at the shokonsha so far we had never had any words between us nor any disagreement and i had ceased to feel bashful when we went out visiting or sightseeing footnote literally there never yet having been any waves nor even wind between us End footnote. now each of us seemed to think only of how to please the other and i felt sure that nothing would ever separate us may our relation always be thus happy the eighteenth day of the sixth month being the festival of the suga jinja we were invited to my father's house footnote the shinto parish temple or more correctly district temple of the yotsuya quarter each quarter or district of the city has its tutelar divinity or ujigami suga jinja is the ujigami temple of yotsuya End footnote. but as the hairdresser did not come to dress my hair at the proper time i was much annoyed however i went with otori san a younger sister to fathers presently oko san a married sister also came and we had a pleasant time in the evening gotoshi husband of oko joined us and last of all came my husband for whom i had been waiting with anxious impatience and there was one thing that made me very glad often when he and i were to go out together i had proposed that we should put on the new spring robes which i had made but he had as often refused preferring to wear his old kimono now however he wore the new one having felt obliged to put it on because of father's invitation all of us being thus happily assembled the party became more and more enjoyable and when we had at last to say good-bye we only regretted the shortness of the summer night these are the poems which we composed that evening futa fufu sorote iwo ujigami no matsuri mo kyo wa nigiwai nikeri by namiki the husband two wedded couples having gone together to worship at the temple the parish festival to-day has been merrier than ever before 
Uchigami no, Matsuri metedashi, futafufu, also by the husband. Fortunate indeed for two married couples has been the parish temple festival. Ikutose mo, nigiyaka narishi, Uchigami no, Matsuri nisoro, kyo no ureshisa, by the wife. Though for ever so many years it has always been a joyous occasion, the festival of our parish temple today is more pleasant than ever before because of our being thus happily assembled together. Matsuri tote, ika atsumaru, tanoshimi wa, geni ujigami no, megumi narikeri, by the wife. Today being a day of festival, and all of us meeting together, what a delight! Surely, by the favor of the tutelar god, Uchigami, this has come to pass. Futafufu, sorote kyo no shitashimi mo, kami no megumi to, medeta karikeri, by the wife. Two wedded pairs being today united in such friendship as this, certainly it has happened only through the favor of the gods. Ujigami no megumi mo fukaki, Fufu tsure, by the wife. Deep indeed is the favor of the tutelar god to the two married couples. Matsuri tote, tsui ni shitateshi yogazuri, kyota no shimi ni kiruto omoeba, by the wife. This day being a day of festival, we decided to put on for the joyful meeting the robes of iogazuri that had been made alike. Footnote. Iogazuri is the name given to a kind of dark blue cotton cloth with a sprinkling of white in small patterns manufactured at Iyo in Shikoku. End footnote. Omoekya Hakaratsu soro futafufu nani ni tatoen kyo no kichijitsu by Goto, the brother in law. How could we have thought it? here unexpectedly the two married couples meet together what can compare with the good fortune of this day matsuri tote hajimete soro futafufu nochi no kaeri zo ima wa kanashiki by oko the married sister this day being a day of festival here for the first time two wedded pairs have met already i find myself sorrowing at the thought that we must separate again Furusato no, Matsuri ni soro, futafufu, Kataro masae, Natsumo michika yo, by Oko. At the old parental home, two married couples have met together in holiday celebration. Alas, that the time of our happy converse should be only one short summer night. On the fifth day of the seventh month, went to the Kanasawa Te where Hari Madayu was then reciting, and we heard him recite the Joruri called Sanju Sangendo. Footnote. The Kanasawa Te is a public hall in the Yotsuya quarter. Hari Madayu is the professional name of a celebrated chanter of the dramatic recitations called Joruri and Gidayu, in which the reciter or chanter mimes the voices and action of many different characters. End footnote. On the first day of the eight month, we went to the Buddhist temple of Asakusa, Kwanon, to pray, that day being the first anniversary, Ishuki, of the death of my husband's former wife. Afterward, we went to an eel house near the Azuma Bridge for dinner, and while we were there, just about the hour of noon, an earthquake took place. Being close to the river, the house rocked very much, and I was greatly frightened. Remembering that when we went to Asakusa before, in the time of cherry blossoms, we had seen a big fire, this earthquake made me feel anxious. I wondered whether lightning would come next. Footnote. She alludes to a popular saying of Buddhist origin. Jishin kwaji kaminari misoka kikin yamai no nakikuni eyuku. Let us go to the land where there is neither earthquake, nor fire, nor lightning, nor any last day of the month, nor famine, nor sickness. End footnote. About two o'clock we left the eating house and went to the Asakusa Park. 
from there we went by street car to kanda and we stopped a while at a cool place in kanda to rest ourselves on our way home we called at father's and it was after nine o'clock when we got back the fifteenth day of the same month was the festival of the hachiman jinja and goto my sister and the younger sister of goto came to the house footnote Uchigama of the Ushigome district. End footnote. I had hoped that we could all go to the temple together, but that morning my husband had taken a little too much wine, so we had to go without him. After worshipping at the temple, we went to Goto's house, and I stopped there a while before returning home. In the ninth month, on the occasion of the Higan festival, I went alone to the Buddhist temple to pray footnote higan festival of the further shore that is to say paradise there are two great buddhist festivals thus called the first representing a period of seven days during the spring equinox the second a period of seven days during the autumnal equinox End footnote. on the twenty-first day of the tenth month otaka-san probably a relative came from shizuoka I wanted to take her to the theatre the next day, but she was obliged to leave Tokyo early in the morning. However, my husband and I went to the Ryusei theatre on the following evening, and we saw the play called Matsumae Bidan Techu Kagami. Footnote. This drama is founded upon the history of a famous rice merchant named Matsumaeya Gorobei. End footnote. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11 of Kotto. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hawaii in June 2010. Kotto, being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by Lefkady O'Hearn. Chapter 11 A Woman's Diary, Part 2. On the twenty-second day of the sixth month, I began to sew a kimono which father had asked me to make for him, but I felt ill and could not do much. However, I was able to finish the work on the first day of the new year, 1897. Now we were very happy because of the child that was to be born, and I thought how proud and glad my parents would be at having a grandchild for the first time. On the tenth day of the fifth month, I went out with mother to worship Shiogama-sama, and also to visit Sengakuji. Footnote. Shiogama Daimyojin, a Shinto deity, to whom women pray for easy delivery in childbirth. Shrines of this divinity may be found in almost every province of Japan. End footnote. There we saw the tombs of the Shijin Shichishi, 47 ronin, and many relics of their history. We returned by railroad, taking the train from Shinagawa to Shinjiku. At Shiocho Sanchome, I parted from mother, and I got home by six o'clock. On the eighth day of the sixth month, at four o'clock in the afternoon, a boy was born. Both mother and child appeared to be as well as could be wished, and the child much resembled my husband, and its eyes were large and black but i must say that it was a very small child for though it ought to have been born in the eighth month it was born indeed in the sixth at seven o'clock in the evening of the same day when the time came to give the child some medicine we saw by the light of the lamp that he was looking all about with his big eyes wide open during that night the child slept in my mother's bosom as we had been told that he must be kept very warm because he was only a seven months child it was decided that he should be kept in the bosom by day as well as by night next day the ninth day of the sixth month at half past six o'clock in the afternoon he suddenly died brief is the time of pleasure and quickly turns to pain and whatsoever is born must necessarily die that indeed is a true saying about this world. Footnote Ureshiki Mava Vatsuka Nite 
mata kana shimi to hensuru, umareru mono wa kanaratsu shitsu. A Buddhist text that has become a Japanese proverb. End footnote. Only for one day to be called a mother, to have a child born only to see it die. Surely I thought if a child must die within two days after birth, it were better that it should never be born. From the twelfth to the sixth month I had been so ill, then at last I had obtained some ease and joy at the birth of a son, and I had received so many congratulations about my good fortune, and nevertheless he was dead. Indeed, I suffered great grief. On the tenth day of the sixth month, the funeral took place at the temple called Senpukuji in Okubo, and a small tomb was erected. The poems composed at that time were the following. Footnote. Composed by the bereaved mother herself as a discipline against grief. End footnote. Omoikya, mini sae kaenu, nadeshiko ni, wakareshi sode no, tsuyu no tamoto wo. If I could only have known. Ah, this parting with the flower for which I would so gladly have given my own life has left my sleeves wet with the dew. Footnote. Nadeshiko literally means pink, but in poetry the word is commonly used in the meaning of baby. End footnote. Samidare ya, shimerigachunaru, sode no tamoto wo. Oh, the month of rain, all things become damp, the ends of my sleeves are wet. Footnote. Samidare is the name given to the old fifth month or, more strictly speaking, to a rainy period occurring in that month. The verses are, of course, elusive, and their real meaning might be rendered thus. Oh, the season of grief! All things now seem sad. The sleeves of my robe are moist with my tears. End footnote. Some little time afterward, people told me that if I planted the sotoba upside down, another misfortune of this kind would not come to pass footnote the sotoba is a tall wooden lath inscribed with buddhist texts and planted above a grave for a full account of the sotoba see the article entitled the literature of the dead in my exotics and retrospectives page one hundred and two i am not able to give any account or explanation of the curious superstition here referred to but it is probably of the same class with the strange custom recorded in my Gleanings in Buddha Fields, page 126. End footnote. I had a great many sorrowful doubts about doing such a thing, but at last, on the ninth day of the eighth month, I had the sotoba reversed. On the eighth day of the ninth month, we went to the Akasaka Theater. On the eighteenth day of the tenth month, I went by myself to the Haruki Theater in Hongo, to see the play of Okubo Hikosaemon. Footnote. It would be unfair to suppose that this visit to the theatre was made only for pleasure. It was made rather in the hope of forgetting pain, and probably by order of the husband. Okubo Hikosaemon was the favourite minister and adviser of the shogun Iemitsu. Numberless stories of his sagacity and kindness are recorded in popular literature, and in many dramas the notable incidents of his official career are still represented. End footnote. There, having carelessly lost my sandal ticket, Gezoku Fuda, I had to remain until after everybody else had left. Then I was at last able to get my sandals and to go home, but the night was so black that I felt very lonesome on the way. On the day of the Sekku, in the first month, 1898, I was talking with Hori's aunt and the wife of our friend Uchimi when I suddenly felt a violent pain in my breast, and, being frightened, I tried to reach a talisman, Omamori, of Suitengu, which was lying upon the wardrobe. Footnote. A divinity half Buddhist, half Shinto in origin, but now popularly considered Shinto. This god is especially worshipped as a healer and a protector against sickness. His principal temple in Tokyo is in the Nihonbashi district. End footnote. 
but in the same moment I fell senseless. Under kind treatment I soon came to myself again, but I was ill for a long time after. The tenth day of the fourth month being the holiday Sanju Nen Sai, we arranged to meet at father's. Footnote. A festival in commemoration of the thirtieth anniversary of the establishment of Tokyo as the imperial capital, instead of Kyoto. End footnote. I was to go there first with Jiu no Suke, perhaps a relative, and there wait for my husband, who had to go to the office that morning for a little while. He met us at father's house about half past eight, then the three of us went out together to look at the streets. We passed through Kyojimachi to Nakatamachi and went by way of the Sakurada Mon to the Hibiya Metsuke, and thence from Ginzadori by way of the Megane Bashi to Uyeno. After looking at things there, we again went to the Megane Bashi, but then I felt so tired that I proposed to return, and my husband agreed, as he also was very tired. But Junosuke said, as I do not want to miss this chance to see the daimyo procession, I must go on to Ginza. Footnote. Daimyo no Gyoretsu. On the festival mentioned, there was a pageant representing feudal princes traveling in state, accompanied by their retainers and servants. The real armor, costumes, and weapons of the period before Meiji were effectively displayed on this occasion. End footnote. So there we said good-bye to him, and we went to a little eating-house, Tempura-ya, where we were served with fried fish, and, as luck would have it, we got a good chance to see the daimyo procession from that very house. We did not get back home that evening until half-past six o'clock. From the middle of the fourth month I had much sorrow on account of a matter relating to my sister Tori. The matter is not mentioned. On the nineteenth day of the eighth month of the thirty-first year of Meiji, 1898, my second child was born, almost painlessly, a girl, and we named her Hatsu. We invited to the Shichiya all those who had helped us at the time of the child's birth. Footnote. Shichiya, a congratulatory feast, held on the evening of the seventh day after the birth of a child. Relatives and friends invited usually make small presents to the baby. End footnote. Mother afterwards remained with me for a couple of days, but she was then obliged to leave me because my sister Ko was suffering from severe pains in the chest. Fortunately, my husband had his regular vacation about the same time, and he helped me all he could, even in regard to washing and other matters, but I was often greatly troubled because I had no woman with me. When my husband's vacation was over, mother came often, but only while my husband was away. The twenty-one days, the period of danger, thus passed, but mother and child continued well. Up to the time of one hundred days after my daughter's birth, I was constantly anxious about her, because she often seemed to have difficulty in breathing. But that passed off at last, and she appeared to be getting strong. Still, we were unhappy about one matter, a deformity. Hatsu had been born with a double thumb on one hand. For a long time we could not make up our minds to take her to a hospital, in order to have an operation performed. But at last, a woman living near our house told us of a very skillful surgeon in the quarter of Shinjiku, and we decided to go to him. My husband held the child on his lap during the operation. I could not bear to see the operation, and I waited in the next room, my heart full of pain and fear, wondering how the matter would end. But when all was over, the little one did not appear to suffer any pain, and she took the breast as usual a few minutes after. So the matter ended more fortunately than I had thought possible. At home she continued to take her milk as before, and seemed as if nothing had been done to her little body. But as she was so very young, we were afraid that the operation might in some way cause her to be sick. By way of precaution, I went with her to the hospital every day for about three weeks, but she showed no sign of sickness. On the third day of the third month of the thirty-second year, 1899, on the occasion of the Hatsu Sekku, the first annual festival of girls is thus called, 
we received presents of dairi and of hina both from father's house and from goto's also the customary gifts of congratulation a tansu chest of drawers a kyodai mirror stand and a haribako work box literally needle box footnote all the objects here mentioned are toys toys appropriate to the occasion the dairi are old-fashioned toy figures representing an emperor and empress in ancient costume hina are dolls End footnote. we ourselves on the same occasion bought for her a chadai teacup stand a zen lacquered tray and some other little things both goto and junosuke came to see us on that day and we had a very happy gathering on the third day of the fourth month we visited the temple anahachiman a shinto shrine in the district of waseda to pray for the child's health on the twenty-ninth day of the fourth month hatsu appeared to be unwell so i wanted to have her examined by a doctor a doctor promised to come the same morning but he did not come and i waited for him in vain all that day next day again i waited but he did not come toward evening hatsu became worse and seemed to be suffering great pain in her breast and i resolved to take her to a doctor early next morning all through that night i was very uneasy about her but at daybreak she seemed to be better so i went out alone taking her on my back and i walked to the office of a doctor in akasaka but when i asked to have the child examined i was told that i must wait as it was not yet the regular time for seeing patients while i was waiting the child began to cry worse than ever before she would not take the breast and i could do nothing to soothe her either by walking or resting so that i was greatly troubled at last the doctor came and began to examine her and in the same moment i noticed that her crying grew feebler and that her lips were becoming paler and paler then as i could not remain silent seeing her thus i had to ask how is her condition she cannot live until evening he answered but could you not give her medicine i asked if she could drink it he replied i wanted to go back home at once and send word to my husband and to my father's house but the shock had been too much for me all my strength suddenly left me fortunately a kind old woman came to my aid and carried my umbrella and other things and helped me to get into a jin rikisha so that i was able to return home by jin rikisha then i sent a man to tell my husband and my father mita's wife came to help me and with her assistance everything possible was done to help the child still my husband did not come back but all our pain and trouble was in vain so on the second day of the fifth month of the thirty-second year my child set out on her journey to the juman okudo never to return to this world footnote another name for the buddhist paradise of the west the heaven of amida amitabha End footnote. and we her father and mother were yet living though we had caused her death by neglecting to have her treated by a skilled doctor this thought made us both sorrow greatly and we often reproached ourselves in vain but the day after her death the doctor said to us even if the disease had been treated from the beginning by the best possible means your child could not have lived more than about a week if she had been ten or eleven years old she might possibly have been saved by an operation but in this case no operation could have been attempted the child was too young then he explained to us that the child had died from a jinzoen nephritis thus all the hopes that we had and all the pains that we took in caring for her and all the pleasure of watching her grow during those nine months all were in vain but we too were at last able to find some ease from our sorrow by reflecting that our relation to this child from the time of some former life must have been very slight and weak footnote or very thin and loose the karma relation being emblematically spoken of as a bond or tie she means of course 
that the loss of the child was the inevitable consequence of some fault committed in a previous state of existence. End footnote. In the loneliness of that weary time, I tried to express my heart by writing some verses after the manner of the story of Miyagino in Shinobu in the Gidayu Bon. Footnote. Gidayu Bon, the book of the Gidayu. There are many Gidayu books. Gidayu is the name given to a kind of musical drama. In the dramatic composition here referred to, the characters Miyagino and Shinobu are sisters, who relate their sorrows to each other. End footnote. Kore, kono uchi e, enzukishi wa, omoe kae seba itsutose mae, kondomo keshi wa onago no ko, tawai mono to te sodatsuru kato, wagami no nari wa uchi wa sure, sodate shikoto mo nasake nai. Koshita koto, Towa tsuyu shiratsu, kono hatsu wa buji ni soratsuru ka, shubiyo seijin shita naraba, yagate mukovotori, tanoshima sho doshite to. Monomi yu san wotashi nande, wagako daiji to, oto no koto mo, hatsu no koto mo, koishi natsukashi omo no wo, Tanoshimi kurashita kaimono, oyako ni narishi wa ureshi ga, sakidatsu koto wo miru haha no, kokoro musuishite tamoe no to. Te wo tori kawasu fufu ga nageki, nageki wo tachigiku mo, murai nakishite omoteguchi, shoji mundururu bakarinari. Here, in this house, it was that I married him. Well, I remember the day, five years ago. Here was born the girl baby, the loved one whom we hoped to rear. Caring then no longer for my person, heedless of how I dressed when I went out, thinking only of how to bring her up, I lived. How pitiless this doom of mine! Never had I even dreamed that such a thing could befall me, my only thoughts were as to how my Hatsu could best be reared. When she grows up, I thought soon we shall find her a good husband to make her life happy. So never going out for pleasure-seeking, I studied only how to care for my little one, how to love and to cherish my husband and my Hatsu. Vain now, alas, this hoped for joy of living only for her sake. Once having known the delight of the relation of mother and child, deign to think of the heart of the mother who sees her child die before her. Footnote, that is, before she herself, the mother dies. There is a colloquial phrase in the Japanese texts. Koga oya ni sakiratsu is the common expression. The child goes before the parents. That is to say, dies before the parents. End footnote. All of the foregoing is addressed to the spirit of the dead child. Translator Now, while husband and wife, each clasping the hands of the other, make lament together, if any one pausing at the entrance should listen to their sorrow, surely the paper window would be moistened by tears from without. About the time of Hatsu's death, the law concerning funerals was changed for the better, and permission was given for the burning of corpses in Okubo. So I asked Namiki to have the body sent to the temple of which his family had always been parishioners, providing that there should be no legal difficulty about the matter. Accordingly, the funeral took place at Monjoji, a temple belonging to the Asakusa branch of the Hongwanji Shinju, and the ashes were there interred. My sister Ko was sick in bed with a rather bad cold at the time of Hatsu's death, but she visited us very soon after the news had reached her. And she called again a few days later to tell us that she had become almost well and that we had no more cause to feel anxious about her. As for myself, I felt a dread of going out anywhere, and I did not leave the house for a whole month. But as custom does not allow one to remain always indoors, I had to go out at last, and I made the required visit to fathers and to my sisters. 
having become quite ill i hoped that mother would be able to help me but ko was again sick and yoshi a younger sister here mentioned for the first time and mother had both to attend her constantly so i could get no aid from father's house there was no one to help me except some of my female neighbors who attended me out of pure kindness when they could spare the time at last i got horishi to engage a good old woman to assist me and under her kind care i began to get well about the beginning of the eighth month i felt much stronger on the fourth day of the ninth month my sister ko died of consumption it had been agreed beforehand that if an unexpected matter a euphemistic expression for death came to pass my younger sister yoshi should be received in the place of ko as gotoshi found it inconvenient to live altogether alone the marriage took place on the eleventh day of the same month and the usual congratulations were offered on the last day of the same month okadashi suddenly died we found ourselves greatly troubled pecuniarily embarrassed by the expenses that all these events caused us when i first heard that yoshi had been received so soon after the death of ko i was greatly displeased but i kept my feelings hidden and i spoke to the man as before on the eleventh month goto went alone to sapporo on the second day of the second month thirty-third year of meiji nineteen hundred goto shi returned to tokyo and on the fourteenth day of the same month he went away again to hokkaido yezo taking yoshi with him on the twentieth day of the second month at six o'clock in the morning my third child a boy was born both mother and child were well we had expected a girl but it was a boy that was born so when my husband came back from his work he was greatly surprised and pleased to find that he had a boy but the child was not well able to take the breast so we had to nourish him by means of a feeding bottle on the seventh day after the boy's birth we partly shaved his head and in the evening we had the shichiya seventh day festival but this time all by ourselves my husband had caught a bad cold some time before and he could not go to work next morning as he was coughing badly so he remained in the house early in the morning the child had taken his milk as usual but about ten o'clock in the forenoon he seemed to be suffering great pain in his breast and he began to moan so strangely that we sent a man for a doctor unfortunately the doctor that we asked to come was out of town and we were told that he would not come back before night therefore we thought that it would be better to send at once for another doctor and we sent for one he said that he would come in the evening but about two o'clock in the afternoon the child's sickness suddenly became worse and a little before three o'clock the twenty-seventh day of the second month ae naku my child was dead having lived for only eight days footnote ae naku is an adjective signifying according to circumstances feeble or transitory or sad its use here might best be rendered by some such phrase as piteous to say End footnote. i thought to myself that even if this new misfortune did not cause my husband to feel an aversion for me thus having to part with all my children one after another must be the punishment of some wrong done in the time of a former life and so thinking i knew that my sleeves would never again become dry that the rain of tears would never cease that never again in this world would the sky grow clear for me and more and more i wondered whether my husband's feelings would not change for the worse by reason of his having to meet such trouble over and over again on my account i felt anxious about his heart because of what already was in my own nevertheless he only repeated the words temei itashikata korenaku from the decrees of heaven there is no escape i thought that i should be better able to visit the tomb of my child if he were buried in some temple near us so the funeral took place at a temple called Senpukuchi in okubo and the ashes were buried there 
tanoshimi mo samete hakanashi haru no yume her poem bears no date all the delight having perished hopeless i remain it was only a dream of spring footnote a necessarily free translation the lines might also be read thus having awakened all the joy fleets and fades it was only a dream of spring the word sameru very effectively used here allows of this double rendering for it means either to awake or to fade the adjective bakanashi also has a double meaning according to circumstances it may signify either fleeting evanescent or hopeless wretched End footnote. no date i wonder whether it was because of the sorrow that i suffered my face and limbs became slightly swollen during the fortnight after my boy's death footnote literally the first two nanuka one nanuka representing a period of seven successive days from the date of death End footnote. it was nothing very serious after all and it soon went away now the period of twenty-one days the period of danger is past here the poor mother's diary ends the closing statement regarding the time of twenty-one days from the birth of her child leaves it probable that these last lines were written on the thirteenth or fourteenth day of the third month she died on the twenty-eighth of the same month i doubt if any one not really familiar with the life of japan can fully understand this simple history but to imagine the merely material conditions of the existence here recorded should not be difficult the couple occupying a tiny house of two rooms one room of six mats and one of three the husband earning barely one pound per month the wife sewing washing cooking outside the house of course no comfort of fire even during the period of greatest cold i estimate that the pair must have lived at an average cost of about seven pence a day not including house rent their pleasures were indeed very cheap a payment of two pence admitted them to theatres or to gidayu recitations and their sightseeing was done on foot yet even these diversions were luxuries for them expenses represented by the necessary purchase of clothing or by the obligation of making presents to kindred upon the occasion of a marriage or a birth or a death could only have been met by heroic economy now it is true that thousands of poor folk in tokyo live still more cheaply than this live upon a much smaller income than one pound per month and nevertheless remain always clean neat and cheerful but only a very strong woman can easily bear and bring up children under such conditions conditions much more hazardous than those of the harder but healthier peasant life of the interior and as might be supposed the weakly fail and perish in multitude readers of the diary may have wondered at the eagerness shown by so shy and gentle a woman to become thus suddenly the wife of a total stranger about whose character she knew absolutely nothing a majority of japanese marriages indeed are arranged for in the matter-of-fact way here described and with the aid of a nakodo but the circumstances for this particular case were exceptionally discomforting the explanation is pathetically simple all good girls are expected to marry and to remain unmarried after a certain age is a shame and a reproach the dread of such reproach doubtless impelled the writer of the diary to snatch at the first chance of fulfilling her natural destiny she was already twenty-nine years old and another such chance might never have offered itself to me the chief significance of this humble confession of struggle and failure is not in the utterance of anything exceptional but in the expression of something as common to japanese life as blue air and sunshine the brave resolve of the woman to win affection by docility and by faultless performance of duty her gratitude for every small kindness her childlike piety her supreme unselfishness her buddhist interpretation of suffering as the penalty for some fault committed in a previous life her attempts to write poetry when her heart was breaking all this indeed i find touching and more than touching 
but I do not find it exceptional. The traits revealed are typical, typical of the moral nature of the woman of the people. Perhaps there are not many Japanese women of the same humble class who could express their personal joy and pain in a record at once so artless and pathetic, but there are millions of such women inheriting, from ages and ages of unquestioning faith, a like conception of life as duty, and an equal capacity of unselfish attachment. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Kotto」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Summer Days Kotto Being Japanese Curios with Sundry Cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn Chapter Twelve Hekegani in various countries of which the peoples appear strange to us by reason of beliefs ideas customs and arts having nothing in common with our own there can be found something in the nature of the land something in its flora or fauna characterized by a corresponding strangeness probably the relative queerness of the exotic nature in such regions helped more or less to develop the apparent oddity of the exotic mind national differences of thought or feeling should not be less evolutionally interpretable than the forms of vegetables or of insects and in the mental evolution of a people the influence of environment upon imagination must be counted as a factor these reflections were induced by a box of crabs sent me from the province of choshu crabs possessing that very same quality of grotesqueness which we are accustomed to think of as being peculiarly Japanese. On the backs of these creatures there are bossings and depressions that curiously simulate the shape of a human face, a distorted face, a face modeled in relief as a Japanese craftsman might have modeled it in some moment of artistic whim. Two varieties of such crabs, nicely dried and polished, are constantly exposed for sale in the shops of Akamagaseki, better known to foreigners by the name of Shimonoseki. They are caught along the neighboring stretch of coast called Dan no Ura, where the great clan of Heke, or Taira, were exterminated in a naval battle seven centuries ago by the rival clan of Genji, or Minamoto. Readers of Japanese history will remember the story of the imperial nun Ni no Ama, who in the hour of that awful tragedy composed a poem and then leaped into the sea with the child emperor Antoku in her arms. Now the grotesque crabs of this coast are called Hekegani, or Heke crabs, because of a legend that the spirits of the drowned and slaughtered warriors of the Heke clan assume such shapes, and it is said that the fury or the agony of the death struggle can still be discerned in the faces upon the backs of the crabs. But to feel the romance of this legend, you should be familiar with the old pictures of the fight of Dan no Ura. Old colored prints of the armored combatants, with their grim battle masks of iron and their great fierce eyes. The smaller variety of crab is known simply as a heke crab, hekegani. Each hekegani is supposed to be animated by the spirit of a common heke warrior only, an ordinary samurai. But... The larger kind of crab is also termed taishogani, chieftain crab, or tatsugashira, dragon helmet, and all taishogani, or tatsugashira, are thought to be animated by ghosts of those great heike captains, who bore upon their helmets monsters unknown to western heraldry, and glittering horns, and dragons of gold. I got a Japanese friend to draw for me the two pictures of Hekegani herewith reproduced, and I can vouch for their accuracy. But I told him that I could not see anything resembling a helmet, either in his drawing of the Tatsugashira, nor in the original figure upon the back of the crab. Can you see it? I asked. Why, yes, somewhat like this, he answered, making the following sketch. 
well i can make out part of the headgear i said but that outline of yours is not according to facts and that face is vapid as the face of the moon look at the nightmare on the back of the real crab End of chapter 12 Recording by Summer Days Chapter 13 of Koto This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Scott Carpenter Koto being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter 13. Fireflies. 1. I want to talk about Japanese fireflies, but not entomologically. If you are interested, as you ought to be, in the scientific side of the subject, you should seek enlightenment from a Japanese professor of biology now lecturing at the Imperial University of Tokyo. He signs himself Mr. S. Watase, the S standing for the personal name of Shosaburo, and he has been a teacher as well as a student of science in America where a number of his lectures have been published, lectures upon animal phosphorescence, animal electricity, the light-producing organs of insects and fishes, and other wonderful topics of biology. Footnote. Professor Watase is a graduate of Johns Hopkins. Since this essay was written, his popular Japanese lectures upon the firefly have been reissued in a single pretty volume. The colored frontispiece, showing fireflies at night upon a willow branch, is alone worth the price of the book. End footnote. He can tell you all that is known concerning the morphology of fireflies, the physiology of fireflies, the photometry of fireflies, the chemistry of their luminous substance, the spectroscopic analysis of their light, and the significance of that light in terms of ether vibration. By experiment he can show you that under normal conditions of temperature and environment, the number of light pulsations produced by one species of Japanese firefly averages 26 per minute and that the rate suddenly rises to sixty-three per minute if the insect be frightened by seizure. Also he can prove to you that another and smaller kind of firefly, when taken in the hand, will increase the number of its light pulsings to upward of two hundred per minute. He suggests that the light may be of some protective value to the insect, like the warning colors of sundry nauseous caterpillars and butterflies, because the firefly has a very bitter taste, and birds appear to find it unpalatable. Frogs, he has observed, do not mind the bad taste. They fill their cold bellies with fireflies till the light shines through them, much as the light of a candle flame will glow through a porcelain jar. But whether of protective value or not, the tiny dynamo would seem to be used in a variety of ways. As a phototelegraph, for example. As other insects converse by sound or by touch, the firefly utters its emotion in luminous pulsings. Its speech is a language of light. I am only giving you some hints about the character of the professor's lectures, which are never merely technical, and for the best part of this non-scientific essay of mine, especially that concerning the capture and the sale of fireflies in Japan, I am indebted to some delightful lectures which he delivered last year to Japanese audiences in Tokyo. 2. As written today, the Japanese name of the firefly, Hotaru, is ideographically composed with the sign for fire, doubled, above the sign for insect. The real origin of the word is nevertheless doubtful, and various etymologies have been suggested. Some scholars think that the appellation anciently signified the first-born of fire, while others believe that it was first composed with syllables meaning star and drop. The more poetical of the proposed derivations, I am sorry to say, are considered the least probable. But whatever may have been the primal meaning of the word hotaru, there can be no doubt as to the romantic quality of certain folk names still given to the insect. Two species of firefly have a wide distribution in Japan, and these have been popularly named Genji Hotaru and Heike Hotaru. That is to say, the Minamoto firefly and the Taira firefly. A legend avers that these fireflies are the ghosts of the old Minamoto and Taira warriors, that even in their insect shapes they remember the awful clan struggle of the twelfth century, and that once every year on the night of the twentieth day of the fourth month they fight a great battle on the Uji River. 
Footnote. By the old calendar. According to the new calendar, the date of the Firefly battle would be considerably later. Last year, 1901, it fell upon the tenth day of the sixth month. End footnote. Therefore, on that night, all caged fireflies should be set free, in order that they may be able to take part in the contest. The Genji Hotaru is the largest of Japanese fireflies, the largest species, at least, in Japan proper, not including the Luchu Islands. It is found in almost every part of the country, from Kyushu to Oshu. The Heike Hotaru ranges further north, being especially common in Yezo, but it is found also in the central and southern provinces. It is smaller than the Genji, and emits a feebler light. The fireflies commonly sold by insect dealers in Tokyo, Osaka, Kyoto, and other cities are of the larger species. Japanese observers have described the light of both insects as tea-colored, chairo, the tint of the ordinary Japanese infusion when the leaf is of good quality, being a clear greenish yellow. But the light of a fine Genji firefly is so brilliant that only a keen eye can detect the greenish color. At first sight the flash appears yellow as the flame of a wood fire, and its vivid brightness has not been overpraised in the following hoku. Kagaribi mo hotaru mo hikaru. Genji kana. Whether it be a glimmering of festal fires far away, or a glimmering of fireflies, one can hardly tell. Ah, it is the Genji. Footnote. The term kagaribi, often translated by bonfire, here especially refers to the little wood fires which are kindled on certain festival occasions in front of every threshold in the principal street of a country town or village. During the festival of the Bon, such little fires are lighted in many parts of the country to welcome the returning ghosts. End footnote. Although the appellations of Genji Hotaru and Heike Hotaru are still in general use, both insects are known by other folk names. In different provinces the Genji is called O Hotaru, or Great Firefly, Ushi Hotaru, or Ox Firefly, Kuma Hotaru, or Bear Firefly, and Uji Hotaru, or Firefly of Uji. Not to mention such picturesque appellations as Komosu Hotaru and Yamabuki Hotaru, which could not be appreciated by the average Western reader. The Heike Hotaru is also called Hime Hotaru, or Princess Firefly, Nenei Hotaru, or Baby Firefly, and Yurei Hotaru, or Ghost Firefly. But these are only examples chosen at random. In almost every part of Japan there is a special folk name for the insect. 3. There are many places in Japan which are famous for fireflies, places which people visit in summer merely to enjoy the sight of the fireflies. Anciently, the most celebrated of all such places was a little valley near Ishiyama, by the lake of Omi. It is still called Hotarudani, or the Valley of Fireflies. Before the period of Genroku, 1688 to 1703, the swarming of the fireflies in this valley, during the sultry season, was accounted one of the natural marvels of the country. The fireflies of the Hotarudani are still celebrated for their size, but that wonderful swarming of them which old writers described is no longer to be seen there. At present, the most famous place for fireflies is in the neighborhood of Uji in Yamashiro. Uji, a pretty little town in the center of the celebrated tea district, is situated on the Ujigawa, and is scarcely less famed for its fireflies than for its teas. Every summer special trains run from Kyoto and Osaka to Uji, bringing thousands of visitors to see the fireflies but it is on the river at a point several miles from the town that the great spectacle is to be witnessed, the Hotaru Kasen, or Firefly Battle. The stream there winds between the hills covered with vegetation, and myriads of fireflies dart from either bank to meet and cling above the water. At moments they so swarm together as to form what appears to the eye like a luminous cloud, or like a great ball of sparks. The cloud soon scatters, or the ball drops and breaks upon the surface of the current, and the fallen fireflies drift glittering away. But another swarm quickly collects in the same locality. People wait all night in boats upon the river to watch the phenomenon. After the Hotaru Kasen is done, the Ujikawa, covered with the still sparkling bodies of the drifting insects, is said to appear like the Milky Way, or as the Japanese more poetically call it, the River of Heaven. 
Perhaps it was after witnessing such a spectacle that the great female poet Chio of Kaga composed these verses. Kawa wakari, yami wa nagarete, hotaru kana, which may be thus freely rendered, is it the river only, or is it the darkness itself drifting? Oh, the fireflies. Footnote. That is to say, do I see only fireflies drifting with the current, or is it the night itself drifting with its swarming of stars? End footnote. 4. Many persons in Japan earn their living during the summer months by catching and selling fireflies. Indeed, the extent of this business entitles it to be regarded as a special industry. The chief center of this industry is the region about Ishiyama, in Goshu, by the lake of Omi. A number of houses there supplying fireflies to many parts of the country, and especially to the great cities of Osaka and Kyoto. From sixty to seventy firefly catchers are employed by each of the principal houses during the busy season. Some training is required for the occupation. A tyro might find it no easy matter to catch a hundred fireflies in a single night, but an expert has been known to catch three thousand. The methods of capture, although of the simplest possible kind, are very interesting to see. Immediately after sunset, the firefly hunter goes forth with a long bamboo pole upon his shoulder, and a long bag of brown mosquito netting wound like a girdle about his waist. When he reaches a wooded place, frequented by fireflies, usually some spot where the willows are planted, on the bank of a river or lake, he halts and watches the trees. As soon as the trees begin to twinkle satisfactorily, he gets his net ready, approaches the most luminous tree, and with his long pole strikes the branches. The fireflies, dislodged by the shock, do not immediately take flight as more active insects would do under the circumstances, but drop helplessly to the ground, beetle-wise, where their light, always more brilliant in moments of fear or pain, renders them conspicuous. If suffered to remain upon the ground for a few moments, they will fly away, but the catcher, picking them up with astonishing quickness, using both hands at once, deftly tosses them into his mouth, because he cannot lose the time required to put them one by one into the bag. Only when his mouth can hold no more does he drop the fireflies, unharmed, into the netting. Thus the firefly catcher works until about two o'clock in the morning, the old Japanese hour of ghosts, at which time the insects begin to leave the trees and seek the dewy soil. There they are said to bury their tails so as to remain viewless. But now the hunter changes his tactics. Taking a bamboo broom, he brushes the surface of the turf lightly and quickly. Whenever touched or alarmed by the broom, the fireflies display their lanterns and are immediately nipped and bagged. A little before dawn, the hunters return to town. At the firefly shops, the captured insects are sorted as soon as possible, according to the brilliancy of their light, the more luminous being the higher priced. Then they are put into gauze-covered boxes or cages, with a certain quantity of moistened grass in each cage. From one hundred to two hundred fireflies are placed in a single cage, according to grade. To these cages are attached small wooden tablets inscribed with the names of customers, such as hotel proprietors, restaurant keepers, wholesale and retail insect merchants, and private persons who have ordered large quantities of fireflies for some particular festivity. The boxes are dispatched to their destinations by nimble messengers, for goods of this class cannot be safely entrusted to express companies. Great numbers of fireflies are ordered for display at evening parties in the summer season. A large Japanese guest room usually overlooks a garden, and during a banquet or other evening entertainment given in the sultry season, it is customary to set fireflies at liberty in the garden after sunset, that the visitors may enjoy the sight of the sparkling. Restaurant keepers purchase largely. In the famous Dotombori of Osaka, there is a house where myriads of fireflies are kept in a large space enclosed by mosquito netting and customers of this house are permitted to enter the enclosure and capture a certain number of fireflies to take home with them. The wholesale price of living fireflies ranges from three sen per hundred up to thirteen sen per hundred, according to season and quality. Retail dealers sell them in cages, and in Tokyo the price of a cage of fireflies ranges from three sen up to several dollars. The cheapest kind of cage containing only three or four fireflies, is scarcely more than two inches square. But the costly cages, 
veritable marvels of bamboo work beautifully decorated are as large as cages for songbirds firefly cages of charming or fantastic shapes model houses junks temple lanterns etc can be bought at prices ranging from thirty sen up to one dollar dead or alive fireflies are worth money they are delicate insects and they live but a short time in confinement great numbers die in the insect shops and one celebrated insect house is said to dispose every season of no less than five sho that is to say about one peck of dead fireflies which are sold to manufacturing establishments in osaka formerly fireflies were used much more than at present in the manufacture of poultices and pills and in the preparation of drugs peculiar to the practice of chinese medicine even today some curious extracts are obtained from them and one of these called hotaru no abura or firefly grease is still used by woodworkers for the purpose of imparting rigidity to objects made of bent bamboo a very curious chapter on firefly medicine might be written by somebody learned in the old-fashioned literature the queerest part of the subject is in chinese and belongs much more to demonology than to therapeutics firefly ointments used to be made which had power it was alleged to preserve a house from the attacks of robbers to counteract the effect of any poison and to drive away the hundred devils and pills were made with firefly substance which were believed to confer invulnerability one kind of such pills being called kanshogan or commander-in-chief pills and another buigan or military power pills five firefly catching as a business is comparatively modern but firefly hunting as a diversion is a very old custom anciently it was an aristocratic amusement and great nobles used to give firefly hunting parties hotarugari in this busy era of meiji the hotarugari is rather an amusement for children than for grown-up folks but the latter occasionally find time to join in the sport all over japan the children have their firefly hunts every summer moonless nights being usually chosen for such expeditions girls follow the chase with paper fans boys with long light poles to the ends of which wisps of fresh bamboo grass are tied when struck down by a fan or a wisp the insects are easily secured as they are slow to take wing after having once been checked in actual flight while hunting the children sing little songs supposed to attract the shining prey these songs differ according to locality and the number of them is wonderful but there are very few possessing that sort of interest which justifies quotation two examples will probably suffice province of choshu hotaru koi 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 tomose nipponichi no josan ga chochin tomoshite koi to ina come firefly come come with your light burning the nicest girl in japan wants to know if you will not light your lantern and come dialect of shimonoseki hochin koi hochin koi seki no machi no bonsan ga chochin tomoshite koi koi firefly come firefly come all boys of seki want you to come with your lantern lighted come come of course in order to hunt fireflies successfully it is necessary to know something about their habits and on this subject japanese children are probably better informed than a majority of my readers for whom the following notes may possess a novel interest fireflies frequent the neighborhood of water and like to circle above it but some kinds are repelled by impure or stagnant water and are only to be found in the vicinity of clear streams or lakes the genji firefly shuns swamps ditches or foul canals while the heike firefly seems to be satisfied with any water all fireflies seek by preference grassy banks shaded by trees but they dislike certain trees and are attracted by others they avoid pine trees for instance and they will not light upon rose bushes but upon willow trees especially weeping willows they gather in great swarms occasionally on a summer night you may see a drooping willow so covered and illuminated with fireflies that all its branches appear to be budding fire during a bright moonlight night fireflies keep as much as possible in shadow but when pursued they fly at once into the moonshine where their shimmering is less easily perceived lamplight or any strong artificial light drives them away 
but small bright lights attract them. They can be lured, for example, by the sparkling of a small piece of lighted charcoal, or by the glow of a little Japanese pipe, kindled in the dark. But the lamping of a single lively firefly, confined in a bottle or cup of clear glass, is the best of all lures. As a rule, the children hunt only in parties, for obvious reasons. In former years it would have been deemed foolhardy to go alone in pursuit of fireflies, because there existed certain uncanny beliefs concerning them, and in some of the country districts these beliefs still prevail. What appear to be fireflies may be malevolent spirits, or goblin fires, or fox lights, kindled to delude the wayfarer. Even real fireflies are not always to be trusted. The weirdness of their kinships might be inferred from their love of willow trees. Other trees have their particular spirits, good or evil, hamadryads or goblins, but the willow is particularly the tree of the dead, the favorite of human ghosts. Any firefly may be a ghost. Who can tell? Besides, there is an old belief that the soul of a person still alive may sometimes assume the shape of a firefly. And here is a little story that was told to me in Izuno. One cold winter's night, young Shizoku of Matsue, while on his way home from a wedding party, was surprised to perceive a firefly light hovering above the canal in front of his dwelling. Wondering that such an insect should be flying abroad in the season of snow, he stopped to look at it, and the light suddenly shot toward him. He struck at it with a stick, but it darted away and flew into the garden of a residence adjoining his own. Next morning he made a visit to that house, intending to relate the adventure to his neighbors and friends. But before he found a chance to speak of it, the eldest daughter of the family, happening to enter the guest-room without knowing of the young man's visit, uttered a cry of surprise, and exclaimed, "'Oh, how you startled me! No one told me that you had called, and just as I came in I was thinking about you. Last night I had so strange a dream. I was flying in my dream, flying above the canal in front of our house. It seemed very pleasant to fly over the water, and while I was flying there I saw you coming along the bank.' Then I went to you to tell you that I had learned how to fly, but you struck at me, and frightened me so that I still feel afraid when I think of it. After hearing this, the visitor thought it best not to relate his own experience for the time being, lest the coincidence should alarm the girl to whom he was betrothed. 6. Fireflies have been celebrated in Japanese poetry from ancient time, and frequent mention of them is made in early classical prose. One of the fifty-four chapters of the famous novel Genji Monogatari, for example, written either toward the close of the tenth century or at the beginning of the eleventh, is entitled Fireflies, and the author relates how a certain noble person was enabled to obtain one glimpse of a lady's face in the dark by the device of catching and suddenly liberating a number of fireflies. The first literary interest in fireflies may have been stimulated, if not aroused, by the study of Chinese poetry. Even today, every Japanese child knows a little song about the famous Chinese scholar who, in the time of his struggles with poverty, studied by the light of a paper bag filled with fireflies. But whatever the original source of their inspiration, Japanese poets have been making verses about fireflies during more than a thousand years. Compositions on the subject can be found in every form of Japanese poetry, but the greater number of firefly poems are in hoku, the briefest of all measures, consisting of only seventeen syllables. Modern love poems relating to the firefly are legion, but the majority of these, written in the popular twenty-six-syllable form called doduitsu, appear to consist of little more than variants of one old classic fancy, comparing the silent burning of the insect's light to the consuming passion that is never uttered. Perhaps my readers will be interested by the following selection of firefly poems. Some of the compositions are many centuries old. Catching Fireflies Mayoigo no nakunaku tsukamu hotaru kana Ah, the lost child, though crying and crying, still he catches fireflies. Kuraki yori, kuraki hito yobu, hotaru kana. Out of the blackness, black people call to each other. They are hunting fireflies. Iu koto no kikoete ya takaku tobu hotaru. Ah, having heard the voices of people crying, catch it. The firefly now flies higher. 
追われては、月に隠れるほたるかな。Ah, the cunning fireflies. Being chased, they hide themselves in the moonlight. うばよって、ふみ殺したるほたるかな。Two firefly catchers having tried to seize it at the same time. The poor firefly is trampled to death. The light of fireflies. Hotarubi ya, mada kure yaranu, hashi no uri. Fireflies already sparkling under the bridge, and it is not yet dark. Mizu gusa no kururu to miete, tobu hotaru. When the water grasses appear to grow dark, the fireflies begin to fly. Footnote. More literally, the water grasses having appeared to grow dark, the fireflies begin to fly. The phrase, kururu to miete, reminds one of the second stanza in that most remarkable of modern fairy ballads, Mr. Yeats' Folk of the Air. And he saw how the weeds grew dark at the coming of night tide, and he dreamed of the long dim hair. Of Bridget, his bride. End footnote. Oku no ma ye, hanashite mitaru, hotaru kana. Pleasant from the guest room to watch the fireflies being set free in the garden. Footnote. Oku no ma really means the back room, but the best rooms in a Japanese house are always in the rear, and so arranged as to overlook the garden. The composer of this verse is supposed to be a guest at some banquet during which fireflies are set free in the garden that the visitors may enjoy the spectacle. End footnote. Yono fukuru hodo okinaru hotaru kana. Ever as the night grows deeper, the light of the firefly also grows brighter. Kusakari no sode yori itsuru hotaru kana. See, a firefly flies out of the sleeve of the grass cutter. Koko kashiko hotaru ni aoshi yoru no kusa. Here and there the night grass appears green because of the light of the fireflies. Chochin no kiete totoki hotaru kana. How precious seems the light of the firefly now that the lantern light has gone out. Mado kuraki shoji wo noboru hotaru kana. The window itself is dark, but see, a firefly is creeping up the paper pane. Moe yasuku, mata keye yasuki, hotaru kana. How easily kindled and how easily put out again is the light of the firefly. Hitotsukite niwa no tsuyukeki, hotaru kana. Oh, a single firefly having come, one can see the dew in the garden. Te no hira wo hawashi miyuru hotaru kana. Oh, this firefly, as it crawls on the palm of my hand, its legs are visible by its own light. Osoroshi no te ni sukitoro hotaru kana. It is enough to make one afraid. See, the light of this firefly shows through my hand. Footnote. That is to say, makes the fingers appear diaphanous, as if held before a bright candle flame. This suggestion of rosy semi transparency implies a female speaker. End footnote. Sabeshi saya, ishaku kiete yuku hotaru. How uncanny the firefly shoots to within a foot of me, and out goes the light. Yuku saki no sawaru mono naki hotaru kana. There goes a firefly, but there is nothing in front of it to take hold of, nothing to touch. What can it be seeking, the ghostly creature? Hokigi ni arito wa miete hotaru kana. In this hoki bush it certainly appeared to be, the firefly. But where is it? Sode e kite. Yohan no hotaru sabishi kana. This midnight firefly coming upon the sleeve of my robe. How weird. Footnote. The word sabishi usually signifies lonesome or melancholy, but the sense of it here is weird. 
This verse suggests the popular fancy that the soul of a person, living or dead, may assume the form of a firefly. End footnote. Yanagiba no yami saki kaisu hotaru kana. For this willow tree, the season of budding would seem to have returned in the dark. Look at the fireflies. Mizu soko no kage wo kowagaru hotaru kana. Ah, he is afraid of the darkness under the water, that firefly. Therefore he lights his tiny lantern. Sugitaru wa me ni mono sugoshi tobu hotaru. Ah, I am going too far. The flitting of the fireflies here is a lonesome sight. Hotarubi a kusa ni osamaru yoakegata. Ah, the firefly lights. As the darkness begins to break, they bury themselves in the grass. Love Poems Mure yo hotaru mono iu kao no miuru hodo. O oh, fireflies, gather here long enough to make visible the face of the person who says these things to me. Footnote. The speaker is supposed to be a woman. Somebody has been making love to her in the dark, and she half doubts the sincerity of the professed affection. End footnote. Oto mo sere, omoi ni moyuru, hotaru koso, naku mushi yori mo, aware narikeri not making even a sound, yet burning with desire. For this the firefly indeed has become more worthy of pity than any insect that cries. Footnote. From the Fugetsu Shu. The speaker is a woman. By the simile of the silent glowing firefly, she suggests her own secret love. End footnote. Yu sareba hotaru yori kini mo yure domo hikari mineba ya hito no surenaki. When evening falls, though the soul of me burn more than burns the firefly, as the light of that burning is viewless, the person, beloved, remains unmoved. Footnote. From the Kokon Wakashu Enkyo. The speaker is supposed to be a woman. End footnote. Miscellaneous. Suito yuku mizugi wa suzushi tobu hotaru. Here at the water's edge. How pleasantly cool, and the fireflies go shooting by. Suito. Mitsu e kite. Hiku naritaru hotaru kana. Having reached the water, he makes himself low, the firefly. Footnote. Or he stoops low. The word hikui really means low of stature. End footnote. Kuzuno hano ura utsu ameya tobu hotaru. The rain beats upon the kuzu plant. Away starts the firefly from the underside of the leaf. Footnote. A kind of arrow root. End footnote. Ame no yo wa shita bakari yuku hotaru kana. Ah, this rainy night they only go along the ground, the fireflies. Yura yura to koame furu yo no hotaru kana. How they swing themselves to and fro, the fireflies on a night of drizzling rain. Aki nureba kusa nomizo hotaru kago. With the coming of the dawn, indeed, there is nothing visible but the grass in the cage of the firefly. Yoga akte mushi ni naritaru hotaru kana. With the coming of the dawn, they change into insects again, these fireflies. Hiru mireba kubi suji akaki hotaru kana. Oh, this firefly, seen by the daylight, the nape of its neck is red. Hotaru kote shiba shigomai ni fuzei kana. Having bought fireflies, respectfully accord them the favor of four or five tufts of lawn grass. Footnote. Not literal and I doubt whether this poem could be satisfactorily translated into English. There is a delicate humor in the use of the word fusei, used in speaking humbly of oneself, or of one's endeavors to please a superior. End footnote. Song of the Firefly Seller 
futatsu, mitsu, hanashite misenu, hotaru uri. Mitsu, yotsu wa, akkari ni nokose, hotaru uri. Onogami wa, yami ni kairu ya, hotaru uri. He will not give you the chance to see two or three fireflies set free this firefly seller. He leaves in the cage three or four, just to make a light, this firefly seller. For now he must take his own body back into the dark night, this firefly seller. 7. But the true romance of the firefly is to be found neither in the strange fields of Japanese folklore, nor in the quaint gardens of Japanese poetry, but in the vast profound of science. About science I know little or nothing, and that is why I am not afraid to rush in where angels fear to tread. If I knew what Professor Watase knows about fireflies, I should feel myself less free to cross the boundaries of relative experience. As it is, I can venture theories. The tremendous hypotheses of physical and psychical evolution no longer seem to me hypotheses. I should never dream of doubting them. I have ceased to wonder at the growth of life out of that which has been called not living, the development of organic out of inorganic existence. The one amazing fact of organic evolution to which my imagination cannot become accustomed is the fact that the substance of life should possess the latent capacity or tendency to build itself into complexities incomprehensible of systematic structure. The power of that substance to evolve radiance or electricity is not really more extraordinary than its power to evolve color, and that a noctiluca or a luminous centipede or a firefly should produce light ought not to seem more wonderful than that a plant should produce blue or purple flowers. But the biological interpretation of the phenomenon leaves me wondering, just as much as before, at the particular miracle of the machinery by which the light is made, to find embedded in the body of the insect a microscopic working model of everything comprised under the technical designation of an electric plant would not be nearly so wonderful a discovery as the discovery of what actually exists. Here is a firefly, able with its infinitesimal dynamo to produce a pure cold light at one four hundredth part of the cost of the energy expended in a candle flame. Now why should there have been evolved in the tail of this tiny creature a luminiferous mechanism at once so elaborate and so effective that our greatest physiologists and chemists are still unable to understand the operation of it, and our best electricians impotent to conceive the possibility of imitating it? Why should the living tissues crystallize or build themselves into structures of such stupefying intricacy and beauty as the visual organs of an ephemera, the electrical organs of a gymnotus, or the luminiferous organs of a firefly? The very wonder of the thing forbids me to imagine gods at work. No mere god could ever conceive such a prodigy as the eye of a mayfly or the tail of a firefly. Biology would answer thus, though it is inconceivable that a structure like this should have been produced by accumulated effects of function on structure, yet it is conceivable that successive selections of favorable variations might have produced it, and no follower of Herbert Spencer is really justified in wandering further. But I cannot rid myself of the notion that matter in some blind, infallible way remembers, and that in every unit of living substance there slumber infinite potentialities, simply because to every ultimate atom belongs the infinite and indestructible experience of billions of billions of vanished universes. End of chapter 13「Chapter 14 of Koto This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Carpenter Koto being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn Chapter 14 A Drop of Dew Tsuyuno Inochi Buddhist proverb. To the bamboo lattice of my study window, a single dewdrop hangs, quivering. 
its tiny sphere, repeats the colors of the morning, colors of sky and field and far-off trees. Inverted images of these can be discerned in it. Also the microscopic picture of a cottage, upside down, with children at play before the door. Much more than the visible world is imaged by that dewdrop. The world invisible, of infinite mystery, is likewise therein repeated. And without, as within the drop, there is motion unceasing, motion forever incomprehensible, of atoms and forces, faint shiverings also, making prismatic reply to touches of air and sun. Buddhism finds in such a dewdrop the symbol of that other microcosm which has been called the soul. What more indeed is man than just such a temporary orbing of viewless ultimates, imaging sky and land and life, filled with perpetual mysterious shudderings, and responding in some wise to every stir of the ghostly forces that environ him? Soon that tiny globe of light, with all its fairy tints and topsy-turvy picturings, will have vanished away. Even so, within another little while, you and I must likewise dissolve and disappear. Between the vanishing of the drop and the vanishing of the man, what difference? A difference of words. But ask yourself, what becomes of the dewdrop? By the great sun its atoms are separated and lifted and scattered. To cloud and earth, to river and sea they go, and out of land and stream and sea again. They will be updrawn, only to fall and to scatter anew. They will creep in opalescent mists. They will whiten in frost and hail and snow. They will reflect again the forms and the colors of the macrocosm. They will throb to the ruby pulsing of hearts that are yet unborn. For each one of them must combine again with countless kindred atoms for the making of other drops, drops of dew and rain and sap, of blood and sweat and tears. How many times? Billions of ages before our sun began to burn, those atoms probably moved in other drops, reflecting the sky tints and the earth colors of worlds in some past universe. And after this present universe shall have vanished out of space, those very same atoms, by virtue of the forces incomprehensible that made them, will probably continue to sphere in dews that will shadow the morning beauty of planets yet to be. Even so with the particles of that composite which you term your very self. Before the hosts of heaven the atoms of you were, and thrilled, and quickened, and reflected appearances of things. And when all the stars of the visible night shall have burnt themselves out, those atoms will doubtless again take part in the orbing of mind, will tremble again in thoughts, emotions, memories, in all the joys and pains of lives still to be lived, in worlds still to be evolved. Your personality, your peculiarity, that is to say your ideas, sentiments, recollections, your very particular hopes and fears and loves and hates, why, in each of a trillion of dewdrops, there must be differences infinitesimal of atom thrilling and of reflection. And in every one of the countless pearls of ghostly vapor, updrawn from the sea of birth and death, there are like infinitesimal peculiarities. Your personality signifies in the eternal order just as much as the especial motion of molecules in the shivering of any single drop. Perhaps in no other drop will the thrilling and the picturing be ever exactly the same. But the dews will continue to gather and to fall, and there will always be quivering pictures. The very delusion of delusions is the idea of death as loss. There is no loss. 
because there is not any self that can be lost. Whatsoever was, that you have been. Whatsoever is, that you are. Whatsoever will be, that you must become. Personality. Individuality. The ghosts of a dream in a dream. Life infinite only there is, and all that appears to be is but the thrilling of it. Sun, moon, and stars. Earth, sky, and sea. And mind, and man and space and time. All of them are shadows. The shadows come and go. The shadow-maker shapes forever. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of Koto. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Carpenter. Koto being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs. By Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter 15. Gaki. Venerable Nagasena, are there such things as demons in the world? Yes, O king. Do they ever leave that condition of existence? Yes, they do. But if so, why is it that the remains of those demons are never found? Their remains are found, O king. The remains of bad demons can be found in the form of worms, and beetles, and ants, and snakes, and scorpions, and centipedes. The Questions of King Melinda 1. There are moments in life when truths but dimly known before Beliefs first vaguely reached through multiple processes of reasoning suddenly assume the vivid character of emotional convictions. Such an experience came to me the other day, on the Suruga coast, while resting under the pines that fringed the beach, something in the vital warmth and luminous peace of the hour, some quivering rapture of wind and light, very strangely bestirred an old belief of mine, the belief that all being is one one i felt myself to be with the thrilling of breeze and the racing of wave with every flutter of shadow and flicker of sun with the azure of sky and sea with the great green hush of the land in some new and wonderful way i found myself assured that there never could have been a beginning that there never could be an end nevertheless the ideas of the moment were not new the novelty of the experience was altogether in the peculiar intensity with which they presented themselves, making me feel that the flashing dragonflies and the long gray sand crickets and the shrilling sami overhead and the little red crabs astir under the roots of the pines were all of them brothers and sisters. I seemed to understand, as never before, how the mystery that is called the soul of me must have quickened in every form of past existence and must as certainly continue to behold the sun for other millions of summers through eyes of other countless shapes of future being. And I tried to think the long, slow thoughts of the long gray crickets, and the thoughts of the darting, shimmering dragonflies, and the thoughts of the basking, trilling cicadae, and the thoughts of the wicked little crabs that lifted up their claws from between the roots of the pines. Presently I discovered myself wondering whether the consequence of such thoughts could have anything to do with the recombination of my soul-dust in future spheres of existence. For thousands of years the East has been teaching that what we think or do in this life really decides through some inevitable formation of atom tendencies or polarities the future place of our substance and the future state of our sentiency. And the belief is worth thinking about though no amount of thinking can enable us either to confirm or disprove it. Very possibly, like other Buddhist doctrines, it may adumbrate some cosmic truth, but its literal assertions I doubt, because I must doubt the power ascribed to thought. By the whole infinite past I have been moulded, within and without. How should the impulse of a moment reshape me against the weight of the eternities? Buddhism indeed answers how, and that astounding answer is irrefutable. 
but I doubt. Anyhow, acts and thoughts, according to Buddhist doctrine, are creative. Visible matter is made by acts and thoughts. Even the universe of stars, and all that has form and name, and all the conditions of existence, what we think or do is never for the moment only, but for measureless time. It signifies some force directed to the shaping of worlds, to the making of future bliss or pain. Remembering this, we may raise ourselves to the zones of gods. Ignoring it, we may deprive ourselves even of the right to be reborn among men, and may doom ourselves, though innocent of the crimes that cause rebirth in hell, to re-enter existence in the form of animals, or of insects, or of goblins. Gaki. Footnote. The word gaki is the Japanese Buddhist rendering of the Sanskrit term preta, signifying a spirit in that circle or state of torment called the world of hungry ghosts. End footnote. So it depends upon ourselves whether we are to become insects or goblins hereafter, and in the Buddhist system the difference between insects and goblins is not so well defined as might be supposed. The belief in a mysterious relation between ghosts and insects, or rather between spirits and insects, is a very ancient belief in the East, where it now assumes innumerable forms, some unspeakably horrible, others full of weird beauty. The white moth of Mr. Quiller Couch would not impress a Japanese reader as a novel, for the night moth or the butterfly figures in many a Japanese poem and legend as the soul of a lost wife. The night cricket's thin lament is perhaps the sorrowing of a voice once human. The strange red marks upon the heads of cicade are characters of spirit names. Dragonflies and grasshoppers are the horses of the dead. All these are to be pitied with the pity that is kin to love. But the noxious and dangerous insects represent the results of another quality of karma, that which produces goblins and demons. Grizzly names have been given to some of these insects, as, for example, Jigokumushi, or hell insect, to the ant lion, and Kappamushi, to a gigantic water beetle which seizes frogs and fish and devours them alive, thus realizing in a microcosmic way the hideous myth of the Kappa, or river goblin. Flies, on the other hand, are especially identified with the world of hungry ghosts. How often, in the season of flies, have I heard some persecuted toiler exclaim, Kyo no hai wa gaki no yodane? The flies today, how like gaki they are. 2. In the old Japanese, or, more correctly speaking, Chinese, Buddhist literature relating to the gaki, the Sanskrit names of the gaki are given in a majority of cases, but some classes of gaki described have only Chinese names. As the Indian belief reached Japan by way of China and Korea, it is likely to have received a peculiar coloring in the course of its journey. But in a general way, the Japanese classification of gaki corresponds closely to the Indian classification of the pretas. The place of gaki in the Buddhist system is but one degree removed from the region of the hells, or jigokudo, the lowest of all the states of existence. Above the jigokudo is the gakido, or world of hungry spirits. Above the gakido is the chikoshodo, or world of animals, and above this again is the shurado, a region of perpetual fighting and slaughter. Higher than these is placed the ningendo, or world of mankind. Now a person released from hell by exhaustion of the karma that sent him there is seldom reborn at once into the zone of human existence, but must patiently work his way upward thither through all the intermediate states of being. Many of the gaki have been in hell, but there are gaki also who have not been in hell. Certain kinds or degrees of sin may cause a person to be reborn as a gaki immediately after having died in this world. Only the greatest degree of sin condemns the sinner directly to hell. The second degree degrades him to the gakido. The third causes him to be reborn as an animal. Japanese Buddhism recognizes thirty-six principal classes of gaki. Roughly counting, says the Shobonen Jokyo, we find thirty-six classes of gaki. But should we attempt to distinguish all the different varieties, we should find them to be innumerable. The thirty-six classes form two great divisions, or orders. One comprises all gaki world-dwellers, gaki sakaiju, 
that is to say all hungry spirits who remain in the gakido proper and are therefore never seen by mankind the other division is called ninchuju or dwellers among men these gaki remain always in this world and are sometimes seen there is yet another classification of gaki according to the character of their penitential torment all gaki suffer hunger and thirst but there are three degrees of this suffering the muzai gaki represent the first degree they must hunger and thirst uninterruptedly without obtaining any nourishment whatever the shozai gaki suffer only in the second degree they are able to feed occasionally upon impure substances the usai gaki are more fortunate they can eat such remains of food as are thrown away by men and also the offerings of food set before the images of the gods or before the tablets of the ancestors the last two classes of gaki are especially interesting because they are supposed to meddle with human affairs before modern science introduced exact knowledge of the nature and cause of certain diseases buddhists explained the symptoms of such diseases by the hypothesis of gaki certain kinds of intermittent fever for example were said to be caused by a gaki entering the human body for the sake of nourishment and warmth at first the patient would shiver with cold because the gaki was cold then as the gaki gradually became warm the chill would pass to be succeeded by a burning heat at last the satiated haunter would go away and the fever disappear but upon another day and usually at an hour corresponding to that of the first attack a second fit of ague would announce the return of the gaki other zymotic disorders could be equally well explained as due to the action of gaki in the chobonen jokyo a majority of thirty-six kinds of gaki are associated with putrescence disease and death others are plainly identified with insects no particular kind of gaki is identified by name with any particular kind of insect but the descriptions suggest conditions of insect life and such suggestions are reinforced by the knowledge of popular superstitions perhaps the descriptions are vague in the case of such spirits as the jikiketsu gaki or bloodsuckers the jikiniku gaki or flesh eaters the jikida gaki or eaters the jikifun gaki or eaters the jikidoku gaki or poison eaters the jikifu gaki or wind eaters the jikike gaki or smell eaters the jikikwa gaki or fire eaters perhaps they fly into lamps the shiko gaki who devour corpses and cause pestilence the shinen gaki who appear by night as wandering fires the shinko gaki or needle mouthed and the kwakushin gaki or cauldron bodied each a living furnace filled with a flame that keeps the fluids of its body humming like a boiling pot but the suggestion of the following excerpts will not be found at all obscure footnote abridged from the chobonen jokyo a full translation of the extraordinary chapter relating to the gaki would try the reader's nerves rather severely End footnote. jikiman gaki these gaki can live only by eating the wigs of false hair with which the statues of certain divinities are decorated such will be the future condition of persons who steal objects of value from buddhist temples fujoko hyaku gaki these gaki can eat only street filth and refuse such a condition is the consequence of having given putrid or unwholesome food to priests or nuns or pilgrims in need of alms shokenju jikinetsu gaki these are the eaters of refuse of funeral pyres and of the clay of graves they are the spirits of men who despoiled buddhist temples for the sake of gain juchu gaki these spirits are born within the wood of trees and are tormented by the growing of the grain their condition is the result of having cut down shade trees for the purpose of selling the timber persons who cut down the trees in buddhist cemeteries or temple grounds are especially likely to become juchu gaki footnote the following story of a tree spirit is typical in the garden of a samurai named satsuma shichizaimo who lived in the village of echigawa in the province of omi there was a very old enoki the enoki or celtis chinensis is commonly thought to be a goblin tree from ancient times the ancestors of the family had been careful never to cut a branch of this tree or to remove any of its leaves but shichizaimon who was very self-willed one day announced that he intended to have the tree cut down 
During the following night, a monstrous being appeared to the mother of Shichizamo in a dream, and told her that if the enoki were cut down, every member of the household should die. But when this warning was communicated to Shichizamo, he only laughed, and he then sent a man to cut down the tree. No sooner had it been cut down than Shichizamo became violently insane. For several days he remained furiously mad, crying out at intervals, The tree! The tree! The tree! He said that the tree put out its branches like hands to tear him. In this condition he died. Soon afterward his wife went mad, crying out that the tree was killing her, and she died screaming with fear. One after another all the people in that house, not excepting the servants, went mad and died. The dwelling long remained unoccupied thereafter, no one daring even to enter the garden. At last it was remembered that before these things happened, a daughter of the Satsuma family had become a Buddhist nun, and that she was still living, under the name of Jikun, in a temple at Yamashiro. This nun was sent for, and by request of the villagers she took up her residence in the house, where she continued to live until the time of her death, daily reciting a special service on behalf of the spirit that had dwelt in the tree. From the time that she began to live in the house, the tree spirit ceased to give trouble, this story is related on the authority of the priest Shungyo, who said that he heard it from the lips of the nun herself. End footnote. Moths, flies, beetles, grubs, worms, and other unpleasant creatures seem thus to be indicated. But some kinds of gaki cannot be identified with insects. For example, the species called jikiho gaki, or doctrine eaters. These can exist only by hearing the preaching of the law of the Buddha in some temple. While they hear such preaching, their torment is assuaged, but all other times they suffer agonies unspeakable. To this condition are liable after death all Buddhist priests or nuns who proclaim the law for the mere purpose of making money. Although there are gaki, who appear sometimes in beautiful human shapes, such are the yokushiki gaki, spirits of lewdness, corresponding in some sort to the incubi and succubi of our own Middle Ages. They can change their sex at will, and can make their bodies as large or as small as they please. It is impossible to exclude them from any dwelling, except by the use of holy charms and spells, since they are able to pass through an orifice even smaller than the eye of a needle. To seduce young men, they assume beautiful feminine shapes, often appearing at wine parties as waitresses or dancing girls. To seduce women, they take the form of handsome lads. This state of yokushikigaki is a consequence of lust in some previous human existence, but supernatural powers belonging to their condition are results of meritorious karma, which the evil karma could not wholly counterbalance. Even concerning the yokushikigaki, however, it is plainly stated that they may take the form of insects, though want to appear in human shape. They can assume the shape of any animal or other creature, and fly freely in all directions of space, or keep their bodies so small that mankind cannot see them. All insects are not necessarily gaki, but most gaki can assume the form of insects when it serves their purpose. 3. Grotesque as these beliefs now seem to us, it was not unnatural that ancient Eastern fancy should associate insects with ghosts and devils. In our visible world there are no other creatures so wonderful and so mysterious, and the true history of certain insects actually realizes the dreams of mythology. To the minds of primitive man, the mere facts of insect metamorphosis must have seemed uncanny, and what but goblinry or magic could account for the monstrous existence of beings so similar to dead leaves, or to flowers, or to joints of grass, that the keenest human sight could detect their presence only when they began to walk or to fly. Even for the entomologist of today, insects remain the most incomprehensible of creatures. We have learned from him that they must be acknowledged the most successful of organized beings in the battle for existence, that the delicacy and the complexity of their structures surpass anything ever imagined of marvelous before the age of the microscope that their senses so far exceed our own in refinement as to prove us deaf and blind by comparison. Nevertheless, the insect world remains a world of hopeless enigmas, 
who can explain for us the mystery of the eyes of a myriad facets or the secret of the ocular brains connected with them do those astounding eyes perceive the ultimate structure of matter does their vision pierce opacity after the manner of the rentgen rays or how interpret the deadly aim of that ichneumon fly which plunges its ovipositor through solid wood to reach the grub embedded in the grain what again of those marvellous ears in breasts and thighs and knees and feet ears that hear sounds beyond the limit of human audition and what of the musical structures evolved to produce such fairy melody what of the ghostly feet that walk upon flowing water what of the chemistry that kindles the firefly's lamp making the cold and beautiful light that all our electric science cannot imitate and those newly discovered incomparably delicate organs for which we have yet no name because our wisest cannot decide the nature of them do they really as some would suggest keep the insect mind informed of things unknown to human sense visibilities of magnetism odors of light tastes of sound even the little that we have been able to learn about insects fills us with the wonder that is akin to fear the lips that are hands and the horns that are eyes and the tongues that are drills the multiple devilish mouths that move in four ways at once the living scissors and saws and boring pumps and brace bits the exquisite elfish weapons which no human skill can copy even in the finest watch-spring steel what superstition of old ever dreamed of sights like these indeed all that nightmare ever conceived of faceless horror and all that ecstasy ever imagined of phantasmal pulchritude can appear but vapid and void by comparison with the stupefying facts of entomology but there is something spectral something alarming in the very beauty of insects four whether gaki do or do not exist there is at least some shadowing of truth in the eastern belief that the dead become insects undoubtedly our human dust must help over and over again for millions of ages to build up numberless weird shapes of life but as to that question of my reverie under the pine trees whether present acts and thoughts can have anything to do with the future distribution and requickening of that dust whether human conduct can of itself predetermine the shapes into which human atoms will be recast no reply is possible i doubt but i do not know neither does anybody else supposing however that the order of the universe were really as buddhists believe and that i knew myself foredoomed by reason of stupidities in this existence to live hereafter the life of an insect i am not sure that the prospect would frighten me there are insects of which it is difficult to think with equanimity but the state of an independent highly organized respectable insect could not be so very bad i should even look forward with some pleasurable curiosity to any chance of viewing the world through the marvellous compound eyes of a beetle an ephemera or a dragonfly as an ephemera indeed i might enjoy the possession of three different kinds of eyes and the power to see colours now totally unimaginable estimated in degrees of human time my life would be short a single summer day would include the best part of it but to ephemeral consciousness a few minutes would appear a season and my one day of winged existence barring possible mishaps would be one unwearied joy of dancing in golden air and i could feel in my winged state neither hunger nor thirst having no real mouth or stomach i should be in very truth a wind-eater nor should i fear to enter upon the much less ethereal condition of a dragonfly i should then have to bear carnivorous hunger and to hunt a great deal but even dragonflies after the fierce joy of the chase can indulge themselves in solitary meditation besides what wings would then be mine and what eyes i could pleasurably anticipate even the certainty of becoming an amembo footnote a water insect much resembling what we call a skater in some parts of the country it is said that the boy who wants to become a good swimmer must eat the legs of an amembo End footnote and so being able to run and to slide upon water though children might catch me and bite off my long fine legs but i think that i should better enjoy the existence of a semi a large and lazy cicada basking on wind-rocked trees sipping only dew and singing from dawn till dusk 
Of course, there would be perils to encounter, danger from hawks and crows and sparrows, danger from insects of prey, danger from bamboos tipped with bird-lime by naughty little boys. But in every condition of life there must be risks, and in spite of the risks I imagine that Anacreon uttered little more than the truth in his praise of the cicada. O thou earth-born, song-loving, free from pain, having flesh without blood, thou art nearly equal to the gods. In fact, I have not been able to convince myself that it is really an inestimable privilege to be reborn a human being, and if the thinking of this thought and the act of writing it down must inevitably affect my next rebirth, then let me hope that the state to which I am destined will not be worse than that of a cicada or of a dragonfly, climbing the cryptomerias to clash my tiny symbols in the sun, or haunting with soundless flicker of amethyst and gold some holy silence of lotus pools. End of chapter 15「Chapter sixteen of Koto」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malis Linhart. Koto being Japanese curious with sundry cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn. A matter of custom. There is a nice old priest of the Zen sect, past master in the craft of arranging flowers and in the arts of the ancient time who comes occasionally to see me. He is loved by his congregation, though he preaches against many old-fashioned beliefs and discourages all faith in omens and dreams, and tells people to believe only in the law of the Buddha. Priests of the Zen persuasion are seldom thus sceptical, but the scepticism of my friend is not absolute, for the last time that we met we talked about the dead, and he told me something creepy. Stories of spirits or ghosts, he said, I always doubt. Sometimes a Danka comes to tell me about having seen a ghost or having dreamt a strange dream. Footnote. Danka or Danke signifies the parishioner of a Buddhist temple. Those who regularly contribute to the support of a Shinto temple are called Ojikko. End footnote. But whenever I question such a person carefully, I find that the matter can be explained in a natural way. Only once in my life I had a queer experience which I could not easily explain. I was then in Kyushu, a young novice, and I was performing my gyo, the pilgrimage that every novice has to make. One evening, while traveling through a mountain district, I reached a little village where there was a temple of the Zen sect. I went there to ask for lodging according to our rules, but I found that the priest had gone to attend a funeral at a village several miles away leaving an old nun in the charge of the temple. The nun said that she could not receive me during the absence of the priest, and that he would not come back for seven days. In that part of the country, a priest was required by custom to recite the sutras and to perform a Buddhist service, every day for seven days, in the house of the dead parishioner. I said that I did not want any food, but only a place to sleep. Moreover, I pleaded that I was very tired, and at last the old nun took pity on me. She spread some quilts for me in the temple, near the altar, and I fell asleep almost as soon as I lay down. In the middle of the night, a very cold night, I was awakened by the tapping of a mukugyo. Footnote. The mukugyo is a very curious musical instrument of wood, in the form of a fish head, and is usually lacquered in red and gold. It is tapped with a stick during certain Buddhist chants and recitations, producing a dull, hollow sound. End footnote. And the voice of somebody chanting the Nembutsu. Footnote. The invocation of Amidabha, Namu Amidabutsu, Hail to the Buddha Amidabha, commonly repeated in behalf of the dead, is thus popularly named. End footnote. Close to where I was lying. I opened my eyes, but the temple was utterly dark, so dark that if a man had sized me by the nose I would not have seen him. Hana o tsumarete mo wa karanai. And I wondered that anybody would be tapping the mukugyo and chanting in such darkness. But, though the sounds seemed at first to be quite near me, they were somewhat faint, 
and I tried to persuade myself that I must have been mistaken, that the priest had come back and was performing a service in another part of the temple. In spite of the tapping and chanting I fell asleep again and slept until morning. Then, as soon as I had washed and dressed, I went to look for the old nun and found her. After thanking her for her kindness, I ventured to remark, "'So the priest came back last night?' "'He did not,' she answered very crossly. "'I told you that he would not come back for seven days more.' "'Please pardon me,' I said. "'Last night I heard somebody chanting the Nembutsu and beating the Mokugyo, "'so I thought the priest had come back.' "'Oh, that was not the priest,' she exclaimed. "'That was the Danka.' "'Who?' I asked for I could not understand her. Why, she replied, The dead man, of course. Footnote. The original expression was at least equally emphatic. Ah, are desu ka? Are wa hotoke ga kita no desu yo? The word hotoke means either a Buddha or, in this case, the spirit of a dead person. End footnote. That always happens when a parishioner dies. The hotoke comes to sound the mokugyo and to repeat the nembutsu. She spoke as if she had been so long accustomed to the thing that it did not seem to her worthwhile mentioning. End of A Matter of Custom Chapter 17 of Koto This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen Koto, being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn Chapter 17 Reverie It has been said that men fear death much as the child cries at entering the world being unable to know what loving hands are waiting to receive it certainly this comparison will not bear scientific examination but as a happy fancy it is beautiful even for those to whom it can make no religious appeal whatever those who must believe that the individual mind dissolves with the body and that an eternal continuance of personality could only prove an eternal misfortune it is beautiful i think because it suggests in so intimate a way the hope that to larger knowledge the absolute will reveal itself as mother love made infinite the imagining is oriental rather than occidental yet it accords with a sentiment vaguely defined in most of our western creeds through ancient grim conceptions of the absolute as father there has gradually been infused some later and brighter dream of infinite tenderness some all-transfiguring hope created by the memory of woman as mother and the more that races evolve toward higher things the more feminine becomes their idea of a god conversely this suggestion must remind even the least believing that we know of nothing else in all the range of human experience so sacred as mother love nothing so well deserving the name of divine mother love alone could have enabled the delicate life of thought to unfold and to endure upon the rind of this wretched little planet only through that supreme unselfishness could the nobler emotions ever have found strength to blossom in the brain of man only by help of mother love could the higher forms of trust in the unseen 
ever have been called into existence but musings of this kind naturally lead us to ask ourselves emotional questions about the mysteries of whither and whence must the evolutionist think of mother love as a merely necessary result of material affinities the attraction of the atom for the atom or can he venture to assert with ancient thinkers of the east that all atomic tendencies are shapen by one eternal moral law and that some are in themselves divine being manifestations of the four infinite feelings what wisdom can decide for us and of what avail to know our highest emotions divine since the race itself is doomed to perish when mother love shall have wrought its uttermost for humanity will not even that uttermost have been in vain at first thought indeed the inevitable dissolution must appear the blackest of imaginable tragedies tragedy made infinite eventually our planet must die its azure ghost of air will shrink and pass its seas dry up its very soil perish utterly leaving only a universal waste of sand and stone the withered corpse of a world still for a time this mummy will turn about the sun but only as the dead moon wheels now across our nights one face forever in scorching blaze the other in icy darkness so it will circle blank and bald as a skull and like a skull will it bleach and crack and crumble ever drawing nearer and yet more near to the face of its flaming parent to vanish suddenly at last in the cyclonic lightning of his breath one by one the remaining planets must follow then will the mighty star himself begin to fail to flicker with ghastly changing colours to crimson toward his death and finally the monstrous fissured cinder of him hurled into some colossal sun pyre will be dissipated into vapour more tenuous than the dream of the dream of a ghost what then will have availed the labour of the life that was the life effaced without one sign to mark the place of its disparition in the illimitable abyss what then the worth of mother love the whole dead world of human tenderness with its sacrifices hopes memories its divine delights and diviner pains its smiles and tears and sacred caresses its countless passionate prayers to countless vanished gods such doubts and fears do not trouble the thinker of the east us they disturb chiefly because of old wrong habits of thought and the consequent blind fear of knowing that what we have so long called soul belongs not to essence but to form forms appear and vanish in perpetual succession but the essence alone is real nothing real can be lost even in the dissipation of a million universes utter destruction 
everlasting death all such terms of fear have no correspondence to any truth but the eternal law of change even forms can perish only as waves pass and break they melt but to swell anew nothing can be lost in the nebulous haze of our dissolution will survive the essence of all that has ever been in human life the units of every existence that was or is with all their affinities all their tendencies all their inheritance of forces making for good or evil all the powers amassed through myriad generations all energies that ever shaped the strength of races and times innumerable will these again be orbed into life and thought transmutations there may be changes also made by augmentation or diminution of affinities by subtraction or addition of tendencies for the dust of us will then have been mingled with the dust of other countless worlds and of their peoples but nothing essential can be lost we shall inevitably bequeath our part to the making of the future cosmos to the substance out of which another intelligence will slowly be evolved even as we must have inherited something of our psychic being out of numberless worlds dissolved so will future humanities inherit not from us alone but from millions of planets still existing for the vanishing of our world can represent in the disparition of a universe but one infinitesimal detail of the quenching of thought the peopled spheres that must share our doom will exceed for multitude the visible lights of heaven yet those countless solar fires with their viewless millions of living planets must somehow reappear again the wondrous cosmos self-born as self-consumed must resume its sidereal whirl over the deeps of the eternities and the love that strives for ever with death shall rise again through fresh infinitudes of pain to renew the everlasting battle the light of the mother's smile will survive our son the thrill of her kiss will last beyond the thrilling of stars the sweetness of her lullaby will endure in the cradle songs of worlds yet unevolved the tenderness of her faith will quicken the fervour of prayers to be made to the hosts of another heaven to the gods of a time beyond time and the nectar of her breasts can never fail that snowy stream will still flow on to nourish the life of some humanity more perfect than our own when the milky way that spans our night shall have vanished for ever out of space End of chapter 17 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey Chapter 18 of Koto This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org 
Recording by Hawaii in June 2010. Kotto, being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter 18. Pathological. Very much do I love cats, and I suppose that I could write a large book about the different cats which I have kept in various climes and times on both sides of the world. But this is not a book of cats, and I am writing about Tama for merely psychological reasons. She has been uttering in her sleep beside my chair a peculiar cry that touched me in a particular way. It is the cry that a cat makes only for her kittens, a soft trilling coo, a pure caress of tone. And I perceive that her attitude, as she lies there on her side, is the attitude of a cat holding something, something freshly caught. The forepaws are stretched out as to grasp, and the pearly talons are playing. We call her Tama, Jewel, not because of her beauty, though she is beautiful, but because Tama is a female name accorded by custom to pet cats. She was a very small tortoise-shell kitten when she was first brought to me as a gift worth accepting, a cat of three colors, Mike Neko, being somewhat uncommon in Japan. In certain parts of the country such a cat is believed to be a luck-bringer, and gifted with power to frighten away goblins as well as rats. Tama is now two years old. I think that she has foreign blood in her veins. She is more graceful and more slender than the ordinary Japanese cat, and she has a remarkably long tail, which, from a Japanese point of view, is her only defect. Perhaps one of her ancestors came to Japan in some Dutch or Spanish ship during the time of Ieyasu. But, from whatever ancestors descended, Tama is quite a Japanese cat in her habits, for example, she eats rice. The first time that she had kittens, she proved herself an excellent mother, devoting all her strength and intelligence to the care of her little ones, until, by dint of nursing them and moiling for them, she became piteously and ludicrously thin. She taught them how to keep clean, how to play and jump and wrestle, how to hunt. At first, of course, she gave them only her long tail to play with, but later she found them other toys. She brought them not only rats and mice, but also frogs, lizards, a bat, and one day a small lamprey, which she must have managed to catch in a neighboring rice field. After dark, I used to leave open for her a small window at the head of the stairs leading to my study, in order that she might go out to hunt by way of the kitchen roof and one night she brought in through that window a big straw sandal for her kittens to play with she found it in the field and she must have carried it over a wooden fence ten feet high up the house wall to the roof of the kitchen and thence through the bars of the little window to the stairway there she and her kittens played boisterously with it till morning and they dirtied the stairway for that sandal was muddy Never was cat more fortunate in her first maternal experience than Tama. But the next time she was not fortunate. She had got into the habit of visiting friends in another street at a perilous distance, and one evening, while on her way thither, she was hurt by some brutal person. She came back to us stupid and sick, and her kittens were born dead. I thought that she would die also, but she recovered much more quickly than anybody could have imagined possible, though she still remains, for obvious reasons, troubled in spirit by the loss of the kittens. The memory of animals in regard to certain forms of relative experience is strangely weak and dim, but the organic memory of the animal, the memory of experience accumulated through countless billions of lives, is superhumanly vivid and very seldom at fault. Think of the astonishing skill with which a cat can restore the respiration of her drowned kitten. Think of her untaught ability to face a dangerous enemy seen for the first time, a venomous serpent, for example. Think of her wide acquaintance with small creatures and their ways, her medical knowledge of herbs, 
her capacities of strategy whether for hunting or fighting what she knows is really considerable and she knows it all perfectly or almost perfectly but it is the knowledge of other existences her memory as to the pains of the present life is mercifully brief tama could not clearly remember that her kittens were dead she knew that she ought to have had kittens and she looked everywhere and called everywhere for them long after they had been buried in the garden she complained a great deal to her friends and she made me open all the cupboards and closets over and over again to prove to her that the kittens were not in the house at last she was able to convince herself that it was useless to look for them any more but she plays with them in dreams and coos to them and catches for them small shadowy things perhaps even brings to them through some dim window of memory a sandal of ghostly straw End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of Kato. this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nadine eckert boulet Kato being japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by lafcar duhern chapter nineteen in the dead of the night black chill and still so black so still that i touch myself to find out whether i have yet a body then i grope about me to make sure that i am not under the earth buried forever beyond the reach of light and sound a clock strikes three i shall see the sun again once again at least possibly several thousand times but there will come a night never to be broken by any dawn a stillness never to be broken by any sound this is certain as certain as the fact that i exist nothing else is equally certain reason deludes feeling deludes all the senses delude but there is no delusion whatever in the certain knowledge of that night to come doubt the reality of substance the reality of ghost the faith of men the gods doubt right and wrong friendship and love the existence of beauty the existence of horror there will always remain one thing impossible to doubt one infinite blind black certainty the same darkness for all for the eyes of creatures and the eyes of heaven the same doom for all insect and man ant hill and city races and worlds suns and galaxies inevitable dissolution disparition and oblivion and vain all human striving not to remember not to think the veil that old faith wove to hide the void has been rent forever away and sheol is naked before us and destruction hath no covering so surely as i believe that i exist even so surely must i believe that i shall cease to exist which is horror but must i believe that i really exist in the moment of that self-questioning the darkness stood about me as a wall and spake i am only the shadow i shall pass but the reality will come and will not pass i am only the shadow in me there are lights the glimmering of a hundred millions of suns and in me there are voices with the coming of the reality there will be no more lights nor any voice nor any rising nor any hope but far above you there will still be sun for many a million years and warmth and youth and love and joy vast asia of sky and sea fragrance of summer bloom shrillings in grass and grove flutter of shadows and flicker of light laughter of waters and laughter of girls blackness and silence for you and cold blind creepings i made reply of thoughts like this i am now afraid but that is only because i have been startled out of sleep when all my brain awakens i shall not be afraid for this fear is brute fear only 
the deep and dim primordial fear bequeathed me from the million ages of the life of instinct already it is passing i can begin to think of death as dreamless rest asleep with no sensation of either joy or pain the darkness whispered what is sensation and i could not answer and the gloom took weight and pressed upon me and said you do not know what is sensation how then can you say whether there will or will not be pain for the dust of you the molecules of your body the atoms of your soul atoms what are they again i could make no answer and the weight of the gloom waxed greater a weight of pyramids and the whisper hissed their repulsions their attractions the awful clingings of them and the leapings what are these passions of life burned out furies of insatiable desire frenzies of everlasting hate madnesses of never-ending torment you do not know but you say that there will be no more pain then i cried out to the mocker i am awake awake fully awake i have ceased to fear i remember all that i am is all that i have been before the beginnings of time i was beyond the uttermost circling of the eternities i shall endure in myriad million forms i but seem to pass as form i am only wave as essence i am sea sea without shore i am and doubt and fear and pain are but duskings that fleet on the face of my depth asleep i behold the illusions of time but waking i know myself timeless one with the life that has neither form nor name yet also one with all that begins and ends even the grave and the maker of graves the corpse and the eater of corpses a sparrow twittered from the roof another responded shapes of things began to define in a soft gray glimmering and the gloom slowly lightened murmurs of the city's wakening came to my ears and grew and multiplied and the dimness flushed then rose the beautiful and holy sun the mighty quickener the mighty petrifier symbol sublime of that infinite life whose forces are also mine end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of kotol this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by david barnes Kotto being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn Chapter twenty Kusa Hibari His cage is exactly two Japanese inches high and one inch and a half wide. Its tiny wooden door, turning upon a pivot, will scarcely admit the tip of my little finger. But he has plenty of room in that cage, room to walk and jump and fly for he is so small that you must look very carefully through the brown gauze sides of it in order to catch a glimpse of him. I have always to turn the cage round and round several times in a good light before I can discover his whereabouts, and then I usually find him resting in one of the upper corners, clinging upside down to his ceiling of gauze. Imagine a cricket about the size of an ordinary mosquito, with a pair of antennae much longer than his own body, and so fine that you can distinguish them only against the light. Kusahibari, or grass-lark, is the Japanese name of him, and he is worth in the market exactly twelve cents, that is to say, very much more than his weight in gold. Twelve cents for such a gnat-like thing. By day he sleeps or meditates, except while occupied with the slice of fresh eggplant or cucumber, which must be poked into his cage every morning. To keep him clean and well fed is somewhat troublesome. Could you see him, you would think it absurd to take any pains for the sake of a creature so ridiculously small. But always at sunset the infinitesimal soul of him awakens. Then the room begins to fill with a delicate and ghostly music, of indescribable sweetness, a thin, thin, silvery rippling and trilling, as of tiniest electric bells. 
As the darkness deepens, the sound becomes sweeter, sometimes swelling till the whole house seems to vibrate with the elfish resonance, sometimes thinning down into the faintest imaginable thread of a voice. But loud or low, it keeps a penetrating quality that is weird. All night the atomy thus sings. He ceases only when the temple bell proclaims the hour of dawn. Now this tiny song is a song of love, vague love of the unseen and unknown. It is quite impossible that he should ever have seen or known in this present existence of his. Not even his ancestors, for many generations back, could have known anything of the night-life of the fields, or the amorous value of song. They were born of eggs hatched in a jar of clay in the shop of some insect merchant, and they dwelt thereafter only in cages. But he sings the song of his race as it was sung a myriad years ago, and as faultlessly as if he understood the exact significance of every note. Of course he did not learn the song. It is a song of organic memory, deep, dim memory of other quintillions of lives, when the ghost of him shrilled at nights from the dewy grasses of the hills. Then that song brought him love and death. He has forgotten all about death, but he remembers the love. And therefore he sings now, for the bride that will never come. So that his longing is unconsciously retrospective. He cries to the dust of the past. He calls to the silence and the gods for the return of time. Human lovers do very much the same thing without knowing it. They call their illusion an ideal, and their ideal is, after all, a mere shadowing of race experience, a phantom of organic memory. The living present has very little to do with it. Perhaps this atomy also has an ideal, or at least the rudiment of an ideal. But, in any event, the tiny desire must utter its plaint in vain. The fault is not altogether mine. I had been warned that if the creature were mated he would cease to sing and would speedily die. But, night after night, the plaintive, sweet, unanswered trilling touched me like a reproach, became at last an obsession, an affliction, a torment of conscience, and I tried to buy a female. It was too late in the season. There were no more kusahibari for sale, either males or females. The insect merchant laughed and said he ought to have died about the twentieth day of the ninth month. It was already the second day of the tenth month. But the insect merchant did not know that I have a good stove in my study, and keep the temperature at above seventy-five degrees Fahrenheit. Wherefore my grass-lark still sings at the close of the eleventh month, and I hope to keep him alive until the period of greatest cold. However, the rest of his generation are probably dead. Neither for love nor money could I now find him a mate. And were I to set him free, in order that he might make the search for himself, he could not possibly live through a single night, even if fortunate enough to escape by day the multitude of his natural enemies in the garden, ants, centipedes, and ghastly earth spiders. Last evening, the twenty-ninth of the eleventh month, an odd feeling came to me as I sat at my desk, a sense of emptiness in the room. Then I became aware that my grass-lark was silent, contrary to his wont. I went to the silent cage, and found him lying dead beside a dried-up lump of eggplant, as grey and hard as a stone. Evidently he had not been fed for three or four days, but only the night before his death he had been singing wonderfully, so that I foolishly imagined him to be more than usually contented. My student, Aki, who loves insects, used to feed him, but Aki had gone into the country for a week's holiday, and the duty of caring for the grass-lark had devolved upon Hannah, the housemaid. She is not sympathetic, Hannah, the housemaid. She says that she did not forget the mite, but there was no more eggplant, 
and she had never thought of substituting a slice of onion or of cucumber. I spoke words of reproof to Hannah the housemaid, and she dutifully expressed contrition. But the fairy music has stopped, and the stillness reproaches, and the room is cold in spite of the stove. Absurd! I have made a good girl unhappy because of an insect half the size of a barley grain. The quenching of that infinitesimal life troubles me more than I could have believed possible. Of course the mere habit of thinking about a creature's wants, even the wants of a cricket, may create, by insensible degrees, an imaginative interest, an attachment of which one becomes conscious only when the relation is broken. Besides, I had felt so much in the hush of the night, the charm of the delicate voice, telling of one minute existence dependent upon my will and selfish pleasure, as upon the favour of a god, telling me also that the atom of ghost in the tiny cage and the atom of ghost within myself were forever but one and the same in the deeps of the vast of being. And then to think of the little creature hungering and thirsting night after night and day after day while the thoughts of his guardian deity were turned to the weaving of dreams. How bravely, nevertheless, he sang on to the very end, an atrocious end, for he had eaten his own legs. May the gods forgive us all, especially Hannah the housemaid. Yet, after all, to devour one's own legs for hunger is not the worst that can happen to a being cursed with the gift of song. There are human crickets who must eat their own hearts in order to sing. End of chapter 20 Kusahibari Chapter 21 of Koto. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Carpenter. Koto being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn. Chapter 21 The Eater of Dreams. Mijikayo ya. Baku no yumeku hima monashi. Alas, how short this night of ours! The Baku will not even have time to eat our dreams. Old Japanese Love Song The name of the creature is Baku, or Shirokina Katsukami, and its particular function is the eating of dreams. It is variously represented and described. An ancient book in my possession states that the male Baku has the body of a horse, the face of a lion, the trunk and tusks of an elephant, the forelock of a rhinoceros, the tail of a cow, and the feet of a tiger. The female Baku is said to differ greatly in shape from the male, but the difference is not clearly set forth. In the time of the old Chinese learning, pictures of the Baku used to be hung up in Japanese houses, such pictures being supposed to exert the same beneficent power as the creature itself. My ancient book contains this legend about the custom. In the Shosei Roku, it is declared that Kote, while hunting on the eastern coast, once met with a Baku having the body of an animal, but speaking like a man. Kote said, Since the world is quiet and at peace, why should we still see goblins? If a Baku be needed to extinguish evil sprites, then it were better to have a picture of the Baku suspended to the wall of one's house. Thereafter, even though some evil wonder should appear, it could do no harm. Then there is given a long list of evil wonders, and the signs of their presence. When the hen lays a soft egg, the demon's name is Taifu. When snakes appear entwined together, the demon's name is Jinsu. When dogs go with their ears turned back, the demon's name is Taiyo. When the fox speaks with the voice of a man, the demon's name is Guaishu. When blood appears on the clothes of men, the demon's name is Yuki. When the rice pot speaks with a human voice, 
The demon's name is Kanjo. When the dream of the night is an evil dream, the demon's name is Ringetsu. And the old book further observes, Whenever any such evil marvel happens, let the name of the Baku be invoked. Then the evil sprite will immediately sink three feet under the ground. But on the subject of evil wonders I do not feel qualified to discourse. It belongs to the unexplored and appalling world of Chinese demonology, and it has really very little to do with the subject of the Baku in Japan. The Japanese Baku is commonly known only as the eater of dreams, and the most remarkable fact in relation to the cult of the creature is that the Chinese character representing its name used to be put in gold upon the lacquered wooden pillows of lords and princes. By the virtue and power of this character on the pillow, the sleeper was thought to be protected from evil dreams. It is rather difficult to find such a pillow today. Even pictures of the Baku, or Hakutaku, as it is sometimes called, have become very rare. But the old invocation to the Baku still survives in common parlance. Baku kurai! Baku kurai! Devour, O oh Baku! Devour my evil dream! When you awake from a nightmare or from any unlucky dream, you should quickly repeat that invocation three times. Then the Baku will eat the dream and will change the misfortune or the fear into good fortune and gladness. It was on a very sultry night during the period of greatest heat that I last saw the Baku. I had just awakened out of misery, and the hour was the hour of the ox, and the Baku came in through the window to ask, Have you anything for me to eat? I gratefully made answer. Assuredly, listen, good Baku, to this dream of mine. I was standing in some great white-walled room where lamps were burning, but I cast no shadow upon the naked floor of that room, and there, upon an iron bed, I saw my own dead body. How I had come to die, and when I had died, I could not remember. Women were sitting near the bed, six or seven, and I did not know any of them. They were neither young nor old, and all were dressed in black. Watchers I took them to be. They sat motionless and silent. There was no sound in the place, and I somehow felt that the hour was late. In the same moment I became aware of something nameless in the atmosphere of the room, a heaviness that weighed upon the will, some viewless numbing power that was slowly growing. Then the watchers began to watch each other, stealthily, and I knew that they were afraid. Soundlessly one rose up and left the room, another followed, then another. So one by one, and lightly as shadows, they all went out. I was left alone with the corpse of myself. The lamp still burned clearly, but the terror in the air was thickening. The watchers had stolen away almost as soon as they began to feel it, but I believed that there was yet time to escape. I thought that I could safely delay a moment longer. A monstrous curiosity obliged me to remain. I wanted to look at my own body, to examine it closely. I approached it. I observed it and I wondered, because it seemed to me very long, unnaturally long. Then I thought that I saw one eyelid quiver. But the appearance of motion might have been caused by the trembling of a lamp flame. I stooped to look, slowly and very cautiously, because I was afraid that the eyes might open. It is myself, I thought as I bent down, and yet it is growing queer. The face appeared to be lengthening, it is not myself, I thought again, as I stooped still lower, and yet it cannot be any other. And I became much more afraid, unspeakably afraid, that the eyes would open. They opened. Horribly they opened, and that thing sprang, sprang from the bed at me, and fastened upon me, moaning and gnawing and rending. Oh, with what madness of terror did I strive against it, but the eyes of it, and the moans of it, and the touch of it, sickened, and all my being seemed about to burst asunder in a frenzy of loathing, when, I knew not how, I found in my hand an axe, and I struck with the axe. I clove, I crushed, I brayed the moaner, until there lay before me only a shapeless, hideous, reeking mass, the abominable ruin of myself. Baku kurai! Baku kurai! Baku kurai! 
Devour, O Baku! Devour the dream! Nay, made answer the Baku. I never eat lucky dreams. That is a very lucky dream, a most fortunate dream. The axe, yes, the axe of the excellent law, by which the monster of self is utterly destroyed. The best kind of a dream. My friend, I believe in the teaching of the Buddha. And the Baku went out of the window. I looked after him, and I beheld him fleeing over the miles of moonlit roofs, passing from housetop to housetop with amazing soundless leaps, like a great cat. End of chapter 21 End of Koto being Japanese curios with sundry cobwebs by Lafcadio Hearn